Uh, good morning, everyone. It is Wednesday, February 3rd, 8.30, uh, and this is a meeting of the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee. Um, we're continuing our work on weatherization this week, uh, and one of the things we've been, uh, uh, we've referred to numerous times uh, has been energy burden, and uh, the EIC uh, was the, I think, the lead partner on a really helpful study that helps uh, flesh that out. What do we mean by it, and what it, and how does it occur in Vermont? And, very, and they have uh, data um, specific to uh, place as well to share with us. So that's one piece uh, of sort of filling in something we've referred to. And then the second thing is um, Senators uh, Campion and Westman have both brought up a number of times the importance of thinking about transportation. Um, and so we want to widen our lens a little bit uh, today and look at uh, transportation for two reasons. On the energy burden side, it is actually the largest energy cost for most households. Uh, and, um, and then on the emission side, it's the largest source of emissions. So underlying it all is a desire to reduce greenhouse gases. So we're uh, expanding our field of view today to take that in. And with that, I'd like to uh, welcome our first uh, guests to the table, uh, Dan Riley of EVT and Kelly Lucci of EVT. So good morning, Mr. Riley, Ms. Lucci. Um, good morning, you, everybody. And uh, dude, are you able to make me a host so I can share my screen? Yes, I already made you a co-host. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Sorry about that. I'm just going to I'm going to share my screen. Uh, good morning. For the record, my name is uh, Dan Riley and I'm the public affairs director here at Efficiency Vermont. Um, it's great to be back again with all of you. Um, and really, uh, Kelly Lucci is our lead on, on this project and, and she has really done so much amazing work when it comes to energy burden report. So I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes and then kick it over to her. Um, Great. Sounds perfect. Thank you. You heard uh, from our boss, uh, Rebecca Foster, yesterday about our weatherization programs. Um, Kelly and I are excited to be here today to give a, an overview of Efficiency Vermont's Energy Burden Report. Um, we've really always been a data-driven organization um, here at Efficiency Vermont, but really we took it to another level in 2016 with the launch of our first energy burden report. Um, and now it's become central to everything we do uh, here. You know, the, the data is critical to the design and measurement of our programs. Uh, we get to work with, with great partners like, like Jared at EAN on this. Um, and especially as, as, as your committee is, is entering this uh, important discussion about weatherization and how to scale those programs. It, it's great that, that we can come in and, and give you a grounding on some of this data. Um, so what is energy burden? Um, really, the calculation is very simple, but it emphasizes the basic truth that those of us in the clean energy industry should always keep front of mind, which is that lower income people and many of the communities that cannot easily access our program services and products are paying more and getting less. So why is that? It's because the upfront costs of clean energy and, and efficiency are insurmountable for many. You know, you heard yesterday from, from Rebecca say that the average residential weatherization project is over $7,000. This means that the overall transition to clean energy risks perpetuating existing inequality since those who can afford to make the improvements that save the money and reduce the carbon will do so, while those who cannot will be stuck paying higher costs now and over the long term. And so really that, that grounds us in sort of uh, addressing energy burden, energy justice. It really needs to be at the core of the work of what we do. So energy burden is energy spending divided by household income, which equals the total energy burden. Um, and, and really this central equation is, is at the core of everything we do. And, and with that, I, I wanna turn it over to Kelly who can kind of drill down into, into a deeper dive on some of the data. Great, thank you, Dan. So for the record, I'm Kelly Lucci, um, Director of Partner and Customer Engagement with Efficiency Vermont and one of the co-authors of the Energy Burden Report from 2019. Uh, Dan, you can advance to the next slide. Okay. So this graphic's probably gonna look 
uh, fairly familiar to most of you. Um, you can see, and Senator Bray actually alluded to it when we kicked off, um, when we look at uh, energy burden, uh, we try to look at energy comprehensively. So we look at thermal uh, energy spending, we look at transportation energy spending, and we look at electric energy spending. Um, you'll notice that transportation is the greatest driver of energy burden by far, followed by thermal, um, and then electric is last. Uh, I'll note that we find a similar proportion in terms of uh, GH3 contributions from each of these types of energy usage. Uh, Vermont has made many great strides over the last two decades focusing on reducing electric usage and costs, so it's not surprising that electric burden is the smallest, uh, with Vermonters facing relatively higher costs to heat their homes and get from place to place in a state that is largely rural. You can advance to the next slide, Dan. So I'm often asked whether those with higher energy burdens are simply using more energy, but we don't find that to be the case, and it's important to point that out. Um, indeed, spending in highly burdened communities is below statewide average for all three energy categories we looked at. Uh, this makes intuitive sense. Those with more resources are likely to have larger homes, more appliances, and be less concerned about conservation. They don't have to be. Uh, Vermonters with less means are likely to be more conscious of the cost of turning up their thermostat in the winter or perhaps to augment their heating needs with uh, cordwood if they're able to do so, which is a relatively lower cost fuel. So communities with the highest energy burden are not necessarily consuming more. It's important to keep that in mind. Next slide, Dan. So over these next few slides, I'm gonna share uh, maps of energy expenditure. That's the map on the left in each slide versus energy burden, which will be the map on the right in each slide. And I'm gonna share that for each of the three types of energy usage that we looked at. And then we'll follow that uh, with a map sort of combining everything into total energy burden. For electricity, you can see that there are some significant pockets of high energy spending, the map on the left on the Western side of the state. Uh, we suspect this may be um, in part to, uh, due to higher usage by farms, especially in Franklin and Addison counties. Um, uh, particularly to the extent that those farms are leveraging a residential versus a, a commercial electric rate, which is something they're allowed to do. Um, our data uh, is based on residential consumption only for all of the energy categories we looked at. Uh, in contrast to expenditure, electric energy burdens tend to be highest in communities outside of Chittenden County, especially in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, and you're gonna see similar patterns on the next slides with higher burdens outside of Chittenden County um, and generally outside of the Northwestern portion of the state. Next slide, Dan. Yeah. So here's the pattern on thermal. Again, expenditures on the left, burden on the right. So the pattern we see here uh, is that there tends to be lower spending and yet a higher energy burden, uh, especially in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, these uh, severely burdened communities actually have relatively low spending on thermal energy. Um, we think this is due to a higher prevalence of wood heating in the Northeast Kingdom, uh, but wider adoption of that relatively lower cost fuel is still not enough to offset the fact that uh, median incomes are lower in these communities, which means that the energy burden still tends to be higher in this region of the state. You can go to the next slide, Dan. So transportation, again, a little bit, uh, another similar pattern, um, higher burdens outside of Chittenden County. In this case, uh, we suspect this is driven um, in, in part due to uh, lower access to public transit and longer commutes for rural communities. Um, they are relatively high throughout the state though, transportation burden. And again, that's because this is such a high driver of, uh, of energy costs as compared to the other forms of energy we looked at. Um, and this is where the work of organizations like Capstone uh, becomes really important because in a rural state, uh, the options for reducing transportation energy burden are relatively limited um, unless we can find ways to help lower and moderate income Vermonters access technologies like electric vehicles that will help reduce their costs um, and still enable them to get where they need to go. Um, you know, you, you don't have transit access, so you you kind of are limited as a, a person living in a rural community in terms of what you can do if you want to lower your energy burden. Next slide, Dan. 
So this slide combines all three energy types um, into a total energy burden map. So we can see um, how it all fits together. Um, not surprisingly, we find the highest total energy burdens in the Northeast Kingdom, the lowest in Chittenden County, strikingly so. Um, and really uh, what this comes down to is that lower energy burden um, uh, correlates pretty closely with higher income towns. Um, and this is really consistent with the prior maps that we saw. Um, but income is a major driver here. Go to the next slide, Dan. Yep. So we wanted to take, uh, to take those kind of basic findings on where uh, energy burdens are the highest and the lowest. And we wanted to understand, are, are people um, taking steps? Um, are they able to take steps uh, to reduce their energy burden? So um, a key way to do that is to ensure access to energy efficiency and clean energy technologies that will reduce costs over the long term. <laughs> So to do, uh, to do this kind of next level analysis, we just high level um, looked at uh, trends, not granular data for each town, but we wanted to understand um, where was adoption of some of these clean energy and energy efficiency steps uh, the highest in which communities. Note that this data actually came from EAN's very helpful community energy dashboard. Um, and we didn't dive in uh, town by town here to understand why a certain community might be on this list or not. Um, we really just wanted to look at trends. So you'll note though, um, we color coded this. You can see the kind of warmer colors are higher burden communities. The cooler colors, the blues um, and the grays are lower burden communities. And you can see that the most widespread adoption of efficiency and clean energy technologies appears to be in communities with the lowest energy burden. Uh, the exception, though, which it's, I think is really notable, is for weatherization, where we do see some high burden communities with relatively widespread uptakes. You can see this is the column on the far right, weatherized homes. We suspect that this is because um, weatherization is the only one of the improvements listed here where there's a no cost comprehensive offering available to income eligible Vermonters through Vermont's highly effective weatherization agencies. So that's one area where we appear to be um, making some progress and seeing some wider spread adoption of a, of a step that can reduce uh, thermal energy burden. You can advance to the next slide, Dan. So since releasing the energy burden report, uh, we've worked to put this data into action to improve efficiency Vermont's programs and reach more Vermonters. You heard from Rebecca Foster and Darren Springer yesterday that um, uptake is a challenge um, and that incentives and financing are critical to helping people uh, take these steps, uh, but also reaching these customers directly. Uh, the data that we've gleaned from the Energy Burden Report um, has really helped us to make improvements to our, pro our programs and start doing that. One example that this slide shows is the changes in the adoption and uptake of uh, Efficiency Vermont has seen in our moderate income weatherization program, Home Performance with Energy Star, uh, as a result of making a bonus incentive available to moderate income Vermonters through our program. So we did, uh, we had some baseline data that we were able to collect in uh, starting in about March of 2019, prior to introducing this change. Uh, we introduced the change in the summer of 2019. Um, and you can see by September of the following year, we uh, had a pretty significant increase in uptake and participation in that program by customers who are moderate income. We went from about 30% as a baseline to about 55%. So a majority of customers uh, participating in that program um, were moderate income. And so, Kelly, I, I would just add that, you know, I, I think what this slide shows is, is what we've heard from a lot of witnesses over the last couple of weeks, which is that in order to do more weatherization projects, it's about finding the right people, making the right targeted interest, and then offering the right mix of incentives and financing together. It, it, it's really that combination of, of all three. And I, I think the, the finding the people, that's where the energy burden report data has, has been so helpful in really getting this 25% jump. That's exactly right, Dan. Thank you for emphasizing that. So the takeaway is when we intentionally invest resources, uh, people, time, dollars, and finding the data, um, we can actually see some improvements happen quite rapidly. And uh, this is one example, one place where we have seen that. And um, may, uh, may I ask a quick question on the absolutely. finding the people? Um, so in terms of uh, the, uh, I would think energy data would be private. How much 
fuel anyone's using, stuff like that. So when you say finding the people, how does, how does that work? How do you, you pick a town and do public outreach there or how do you do it? Exactly right. So we actually have introduced uh, programs um, that are targeted to specific communities. So we've uh, we've had a targeted, we call it a targeted communities program where we go out and we do community engagement. We'll, um, we will, uh, you know, give presentations, hold workshops. Sometimes we'll offer uh, bonuses specific to a given community um, to really encourage people uh, to, uh, to uh, have some uptake on this. Um, for example, this year we'll be working in Island Pond. Um, they've expressed an interest in helping uh, support people uh, with weatherization. And we're also gonna be partnering with um, VIPSA uh, and uh, Barton Electric to do a focused effort in Barton. Um, and in both of those areas, there's a strong interest in uh, weatherization and supporting people in accessing uh, both Efficiency Vermont's programs and um, the other weatherization programs that are available through, um, through the community action agencies. And over the last several years, we've targeted communities all over the state. And I'm, I'm happy to provide the committee with a list of, of the different communities that we've had. And there's, there's obviously been challenges due to the COVID-19 pandemic for, for that kind of targeted community outreach. But we're really looking forward in, in the next year to, to getting out and ramping up that program again. Definitely. Yep. Um, so uh, we're, our hope is actually, though, to take the uh, energy burden work that we've done and build on that over the course of this next performance period. So I'll just give a quick overview of our next steps on the, the last slide here. Um, so what we wanted to understand is we have this town level data. We can do that town level targeting. You're right, Senator Bray, that um, you know uh, consumption data for things like heating are, are not things that we are, are going to get on a personal uh, level. Uh, but we did want to look at who is participating in Efficiency Vermont's programs currently. Um, and are we truly making programs that are accessible to all Vermonters? Um, so one thing that we are uh, currently working on right now, this is I consider sort of the next stage of the energy burden report, is to actually look at participation data um, for communities across the state and also for demographic groups um, that we have from Efficiency Vermont and to understand um, who is currently accessing our programs. So it's, uh, it's a diversity, equity and inclusion analysis that we're working on right now um, that will help determine that. Uh, our hope is to have results available to share. Uh, we'll post them publicly on our website. Um, we know our, the, the Department of Public Service and the Public Utility Commission are interested in this data as well, so we'll, we'll share it. But um, we expect to have it available the end of March, early April. And we would love to come back before the committee and, and, and brief you all on, on, on that as well once we finalize it. Um, can you say something about... Uh, do you know whether folks that you're, well, you're looking at towns, I'm just trying to better understand people who are in rental housing versus people who own. And um, we often hear about getting weatherization done in rental units is, can be more challenging, uh, especially if renters pay the electric bill or what, the utilities. Um, but I'm guessing that on terms of income, that lower incomes may correlate with a higher percentage of people, you know, with a likelihood of renting. Um, so that renters may be a group that's disproportionately uh, energy burdened. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah. One thing we'll be looking at as part of this next analysis is uh, participation in our programs by people who rent. Um, so looking at communities where there's a higher proportion of renters and understanding, does that correlate with a lower proportion of folks who are participating in our programs? Um, the targeted uh, community engagement work that we alluded to before um, has also given us the opportunity to, um, to do direct outreach to property owners um, and to renters and to develop some new offerings designed to help them participate in our programs as well. So things like, um, you know, really like reaching out to every landlord in the community, trying to build a relationship with one and then use that to connect mm -hmm. with others. We'll offer uh, free walkthroughs from Efficiency Vermont staff of those buildings where we'll outline mm -hmm. potential improvements. And we expect this year uh, to be introducing a uh, financing offer targeted towards property owners to make it 
very easy for them to move forward with improvements, as well as uh, a range of free products and um, services that will be available um, for renters to access as well. But you're correct that especially where there's a, uh, they call it a split incentive where the renters pay the bill, but the land, uh, the property owner is the owner of the property and the decision maker on what improvements are made. That historically has been a challenge, not just for Efficiency Vermont, but for efficiency programs across the country. And many of us are working to find new and creative ways to address that. I would also just add, uh, Mr. Chairman, that we do have a, a partnership with 3E Thermal, looking at providing incentives to multifamily uh, dwellings. Obviously, that's targeting the renter community. It is a limited program. You know, we do have resource constraints, uh, you know, trying to do a lot with a limited budget. But, you know, we, we're, we're, we're very proud of that work and we'd be looking to expand on it if we could. 3E Thermal is a great organization to work with and um, we're very happy to have that partnership. Um, I'm taking a look to see if there are any committee member questions. Okay. Um, another group, Senator Westman. Um, so the start of your presentation starts out with transportation as being the lead. And in all of these, we move quickly to um, um, talking about weatherization and, and, and all of um, those pieces. And it seems to me that the best way to get to lower income people is, um, you know, individual counseling with those people um, up front. And so I'm rambling a little bit here. Um, how holistically are we looking at the energy use of those people at the individual level? And how even is the development of programs to help them address their carbon um, usage and their energy usage? Um, it would seem to me when somebody comes in that we're really good on the, um, um, on the weatherization piece, and there are way fewer programs on the transportation side to help those individuals. Sure, it's, it's a great question. And on the program side, traditionally, we at Efficiency Vermont had been limited because we were not allowed to operate in, in transportation, right? It was, it was the biggest, one of the, the biggest burden and we were prohibited from, from offering programs. The committee took action last year to address that and created the Energy Efficiency Modernization Act, which for the first time allowed us to, to use a, a limited budget there. So, so really it's only since that bill has, has passed and we're just starting that process that we're allowed to get at that. You know, Kelly, I, I'll turn it over to you in, in terms of the balance and how we are able, because it is a great question. Yeah, I, I think it is a, a great question. And, um, you know, I know uh, Paul Zabriskie uh, has been speaking a little bit to the co committee about this as well, but, you know, Efficiency Vermont historically has uh, really leveraged a strong and deep partnership with the weatherization agencies such as Capstone to try to, um, provide wraparound service. So, you know, you don't want somebody to have to have, uh, you know, seven different visits from seven different organizations. If they're going to be connected with one organization that is, you know, in a position to provide more comprehensive guidance, we certainly want to leverage that. And historically, we have leveraged that a lot on the electric and the thermal side. I think there are great opportunities moving forward to build on that existing partnership now that we have a little bit more flexibility um, uh, as uh, as Efficiency Vermont in terms of the type of data we can collect and uh, information we can track and even information we can provide. I mean, historically, if we had customers calling us asking questions about transportation, we really couldn't give them any guidance on that. We weren't empowered to and our staff, uh, you know, weren't uh, you know, as close to that information for that reason, but I, I do see some great opportunities going forward um, to build on that. So it would seem, I, I totally appreciate the going into towns and town-wide um, doing, uh, but it would seem that the way you're going to get to uh, um, people that are not really all that sophisticated and um, frankly, might be a little bit scared in their life and um, in, in a vulnerable position is that direct level of counseling, which I think 
Capstone has, and I think the community action agencies somewhat have. Um, I'm just, I don't get the feel as much. I think we've been, there's not a holistic view of, of these individuals and what their needs are in that assessment. And then that counselor being able to recommend to them, your big issue is, is your car or your transportation. And the programs are less. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I feel like it's a, how do I move this so um, as we deal with these individuals that are um, low and lower middle income families, how do I, how, how do I get to a place where we look at them more holistically? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And I, I again, I, I go back to the to, to Act 151 that passed last year. That was really a critical step in, in terms of, you know, our our contact center when 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 lower and moderate income customers call us, we're able to talk to them about their electricity use needs. We're able to talk to them about their weatherization needs and say, here are the incentives that we offer. Here are the community partners that we work with. But traditionally, we have said, you know, sorry, we, we, we can't help you when it comes to transportation. And so finally, you know, we're able to, st to, to start to dip our toe in the water there through this pilot program. And we hope to be able to build on that. So to, to one day get to exactly what you're describing in terms of let's look at your total energy costs. Here's everything that offers, here's everybody that we work with, and then really leverage that, that statewide reach in, in the platform of Efficiency Vermont. But you're, you're so absolutely that, right, Senator Westman, that, that this process is just starting. As and well, and, and I was going to oh. say, as well, leveraging our existing partnership with Capstone and the weatherization agencies, because um, yes. you're right, there's no reason there should be a separate entity going in and doing that. And so typically, we do have contracts with the weatherization agencies to support them in taking on uh, additional work in thermal and in electric um, as part of a partnership with Efficiency Vermont, there's no reason we couldn't look at building in transportation in that, at least for the next three years while the Act 151 pilot is in effect. Well, what would be helpful to me is what recommendations would you have to make just what you just said happen and um, create um, more permanent relationships with the community action agencies who I think the counseling piece is vital, um, you know, because you got to get inside um, these um, um, the heads of the people that are feel vulnerable and, it, it, and don't have a lot to, how do we create that? And then from there, um, divide up the programs so we really address the energy needs, the um, security needs for those families and reduce carbon at the same time. And how, so what recommendations would you have and I don't expect an answer now, but going forward, what would you do? Yeah, and, and Kelly, I don't know if you, I, I mean, I think the partnership one is key. I don't know if you have had anything to no, add. What's there, the Kelly? partnership, for heaven's sakes? We <laughs> So, I, I, I couldn't agree more on the need, and I do think we'll be, uh, we will be taking steps to build that partnership with, on the existing partnership with Capstone and make sure that folks are getting that wraparound service without having to navigate um, a whole lot of different channels and organizations. I think that's a key opportunity that we have available to us now that we didn't in the past. And how do and Senator, we're certainly able to help? Yes, and, and we, we will do a deeper dive into that and, and kind of can come back with, with more concrete recommendations. Mr. Chair, it would be it would be really helpful if you could almost tell me how. Yeah. I'm done. Mr. Chair, <laughs> uh, Senator McDonald, the, the Senator Westman is asking the absolutely appropriate question, and the witnesses um, are in a difficult position to answer it because they have would have to be critical of us, the legislature, in order to answer it. And one of the things that is clear about dealing with energy issues, um, whether it's electric, transportation, or thermal, and I'm gonna kick myself for using the word partner here, but in each case, when these 
three different needs come to the big dance, they have to bring a partner with them. You can't get into the dance without a partner. And in the, this case, the partner is the funding source. Um, we've used electricity um, fees to deal with electricity. We've used thermal um, uh, fees and taxes on, um, on the product. And when it comes to transportation, um, we don't have a partner. The transportation committee is, has been has yet to take this issue up and say, we, the transportation committee, will raise money to deal with transportation problems. They have yet to do that. And um, Senator Westman is, the, I think, the only member of natural resources that has served on transportation and understands that better than the rest of us, which is probably why he's been very, he's been excellent at asking this question. So we either have to take it upon ourselves on the days that we talk about transportation issues, not on the days when we talk about thermal issues, to try and get the resources for transportation. And I think that's what uh, Ms. Lucci would tell us if she thought it was her place to do so. So um, <laughs> she's in a difficult position as our other efficiency room, uh, as, as Mr. Riley. So Mr. I, Chair, I, I think that's the answer. I would just I would say- it's the way to try and answer um, Senator Westman's question. So. I would just say there are fledgling programs that the Transportation Committee has taken on and are funding now. So I, I'm, I think we need to, how do we flush that out? But I would still say the key in this is counseling for those individuals is key. And she's and they and they're in the difficult position when they speak to to citizens of saying we really can't answer that question yet because there is no apparently there is no steady funding source for transportation and while there is a program my aunt would say you could take that program and you could put your put it on your eyeball and you could see around it so it's minuscule. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start collecting Senate expressions. Um, so uh, thanks for uh, to Senator McDonald Westman for bringing up these questions. I mean, I appreciate that all of us are a little frustrated at the moment. The reason we had Act 62 two years ago was to investigate the all fuels energy efficiency program that would create a legal platform for exactly this sort of comprehensive wraparound service across all fuel types. And then we got the answer back from the PUC said, well, you don't need the overarching entity to organize all that work. You should work with the ecosystem of providers that's already here. And so I think although we are going slower than any of us would like, um, we've cracked the door open two years ago with um, allowing an operating, I don't know if I should call it a surplus, um, the efficiency reminded achieved efficiencies that let them have a, a bank balance that got rolled into uh, accelerating a program. Last year, we started the pilot um, and we passed a bill for the pilot. Now that puts transportation into their uh, charge of work. Um, but as you say, Senator McDonald, it's the money. I mean, that was, that was the loudest message in that PUC report, I'd say, is steady, robust funding for all this stuff. Um, and what I hope is that although we've been focused on weatherization, uh, that um, I appreciate the committee, you know, opening the field up and saying, okay, so we're, we're, not, we're not doing the all fuels energy efficiency utility, but how do we actually create that program, even if it means just coordinating between growing all the, the capacity of all the existing actors in this system. Uh, and I think that's part of where I hope we're heading with our bill um, is to coordinate the money coming in, have a way of gathering it, allocating it um, smartly and then monitoring performance. So, all right, thank you. Uh, um, Ms. Lucci, Mr. Riley, thank you. I don't know if you have any closing remarks before we 
move forward. No, thank you again. We, we appreciate the committee's thank attention you. to this issue. And, and, and Senator Westman, we certainly will follow up on that point on recommendations. It's something we wanted to, to look into a little bit more. Um, and then uh, Kelly and I, we're going to jump, we're going to sign off unless you, unless you need anything else from us, Mr. Chairman. I think we're all set. Thanks for, thanks for checking in. And um, I, we know I, you I, have I, busy schedules. <laughs> Can I just say, I, uh, I look forward to them getting back to us with recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Even if they're critical of us. <laughs> Related to that, Mr. Chair, uh, what's a timeline for that for them to get back to us? Well, Do you want to once, provide them with one? Well, I, you know, I'm going to turn to those who are going to come back with recommendations. Do you, what's a workable turnaround for even just a, a draft? Uh, not a formal set, but just a, something to keep the conversation going. If you could give us a week or two, we would appreciate it. Does that does that work? Sure, a week would be better than two because no crossover is coming. <laughs> no problem. We will we'll, we'll we'll be back within one week. Okay, sounds thank like you a plan. Very much. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Campion. Um, all right, with that. Um, We've built up a head of steam on this topic, and now I'd like to welcome Mr. Zabriskie back to the committee. Um, he alluded briefly in his earlier visit to the transportation side of things, um, and maybe you're offering the kind of programming that Senator Westman's asking about already. I'm not sure. So I good morning. We're, we're, good morning. Uh, Paul Zabriskie, uh, Weatherization and Climate Impact Director at Capstone Community Action. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm flattered by all the attention we got in the last discussion. I, I, would, I would like just to, before I start off on my own remarks, add that trusted partners is, a, is really what we're talking about in terms of who can effectively deliver and support uh, vulnerable families um, with, with diverse programs. And, and those trusted partners um, go well beyond community action. Um, I think that, you know, enabling and making sure that providers have resources, um, you know, providers such as the councils on aging, um, very, you know, the land trusts and neighbor works uh, organizations, uh, the mental health organizations, Food service providers uh, to the low-income community. All, all of these folks have established relationships where uh, they can assist um, their constituents or participants um, to make the the changes, both in terms of understanding uh, the the programs that are out there, as well as focusing on the behavioral component of it and sort of how cultural norms are evolving and, and, and helping people through the comfort component of, of making changes in their lives. So I, I just, I really want to stress that trusted partners is, it really requires a, a, a uh, well, you use the term ecosystem. And I, I think that's an appropriate term. Um, I wanted to speak at first a, a quick overview of transportation activities that Capstone's engaged in. Uh, in 2019, uh, program uh, was funded uh, for a pilot uh, that has become Mileage Smart. That program provides an incentive to income qualified households to access used vehicles that get better than 40 miles per gallon. And this was really uh, targeting the opportunity um, to, to help people who didn't have transportation, who didn't have mobility to access it. Um, and those who were driving vehicles that had a high cost per mile, high emissions uh, to transition to something that was uh, much more efficient. And, and part of that transition is just kind of getting comfortable with the fact that, that it's okay to get out of your truck and into a smaller vehicle. And in fact, uh, half the participants uh, in Mileage Smart have chosen used EVs or plug-in hybrid vehicles where they're finding that, that these vehicles can be quite peppy, that, that you know, they're 
Um, they don't have to have eight cylinders under the hood in order to have uh, a little zip in their driving experience. And I think that, you know, that's something that, you know, the, the early Prius didn't necessarily have. Um, you know, the, the Prius is also a very popular car in this program. Um, but many people just find it to be a car. Now, what's amazing about it is for 20 years that that just a car has gotten 50 miles per gallon on average um, and that technology is well established and and that hybrid uh, drivetrain is now perforating multiple sectors. Um, and that's a good thing. But 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 it's also a somewhat boring drive for some and EVs uh, can can provide some of the excitement that people are looking for in their driving experience. So I, I guess the, on the transportation side, uh, enabling people to make buying decisions that are in their uh, financial interest is important. One of the real barriers that we've encountered is around financing. And I noted in some of the handouts from uh, yesterday that, that, you know, transitioning to clean energy options is often about financing. And uh, the, the folks that we serve don't necessarily have a, a historically great relationship with, with banks. Credit card companies are, are just plain predatory. Um, uh, the, they're, so helping people move towards cleaner transportation is often about a discussion on financing and, and no, it's not. what no. options. Well, it, that's our experience is, is, you know, we, we provide incentives, but people can't access the incentives without actually accessing the financing as well. Mr. Chair. Senator McDonald, do you have something you'd like to chip in here? Yes. Um, financing used cars and used vehicles is the problem Mr. Zabrinsky is accurately focusing on. But getting used vehicles on the market, um, no new car manufacturer or manufactures used cars. That's what moderate income people buy. Um, Jared Duvall will come in here and give us a number that the, at the moderate income Vermonters cars are automobiles, sorry, vehicles are 12 years old. Um, if you want 12 years from now, we'll, they'll be financing used four wheel drive pickups, which are the biggest sales happening today. And they will go to, to poor people and be owned by poor people 12 years from now. Um, that's what's gonna be on the used car market. Um, if we're not looking at that problem where things are going to get worse and worse and worse, um, we're fooling ourselves. So um, I might take my hat off to anyone that's trying to help a, a moderate income person buy a used EV. They're just not available. And if you're going to help them, they're going to be paying a premium for them. But 12 years from now, we'll be worse off than we are today unless we begin to see that new cars are manufactured that modern income people can buy 12 years from now. So you can buy weatherization and weatherize your house in three months. But to get a used, efficient vehicle, um, those are the cars being sold now and will be the dominant vehicle on the used car lot 12 years from now and beyond. I, I've been in, delighted to work with uh, folks who will be coming up later to this morning on the Replace Your Ride program, um, which is looking to retire those 12 year old pickups. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it to them to speak to, to that. Uh, I will note that the typical vehicle that folks are buying uh, through Mileage Smart is a five to seven year old vehicle. Um, and, uh, it, it, they range in price from around $8,000 to, uh, I think 
the average is closer to twelve or thirteen thousand um, dollar vehicles. You know, we have some some challenges in our program design. It was it was narrowly defined in statute. Um, what we're finding in the pilot is uh, we'd like to look at using some of the resources towards a loan loss reserve, towards creating uh, a backstop that we can work with financing entities uh, to reduce their risk in order to provide our consumers with a better opportunity, something that they can succeed at and, and um, establish credit for themselves and, and um, be able to get into vehicles that make sense for them, uh, reduce their overall cost of car ownership, reduce their carbon emissions, uh, and help stabilize their families. Um, Mr. Zabriskie, quick question. Uh, what lenders are you working with? Um, you know, we've worked with VSCCU, we've worked <laughs> with the Federal Credit Union, um, Community National Bank. So we've worked with several. Um, years ago, the community action agencies had a relationship with BSECU where we did offer a loan loss reserve on, on uh, used cars. It, that was through what was called Community Action Motors, which was a, a model that was very similar to what you might know as Good News Garage. Uh, the challenge there is, is we're now we're talking about cars that are really... Uh, mostly exhausted their economic life um, versus trying to be working with vehicles which uh, are really much more mechanically sound and have a you know a five to seven year life. The, the, the community action motors was was you know the cars that we were getting donated um, were on their last legs or needed significant work and, and were headed towards major repairs uh, shortly after they were purchased. And, and that's one of the challenge of, for folks who are sort of continually buying in the less than $5,000 marketplace um, is you're just, you're just you know, one uh, month away from a, a repair that, that sets you back. You no longer have a vehicle when you're back uh, struggling to, to get to work. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think um, I, I wanted to comment sort of briefly on uh, the role of, or, or the ecosystem as it was described. You know, I, I have long believed that we have a Vermont state-owned brand uh, to deliver conservation efficiency and, and uh, cost-effective alternatives for clean energy. And that is Efficiency Vermont. And uh, it has, people know it many different ways. Those of us who sort of deal with the policy world know a different entity than most of the folks on the street. Um, but that brand is where a lot of people will turn. Um, and it has provided a good source of information. Um, it's trusted. It's not always loved um, just because we're all paying into it. And there's always a little bit of blowback on any entity like that. Um, but it, it, you know, both the data and empirical experience for me is, is that people know that they can go there and they'll get a straight answer that isn't uh, tainted with some uh, manufacturer or marketers um, bent on, on their particular product. Um, it's been effective in terms of the outcomes we've gotten from it. Um, it's been sort of narrowly defined. Uh, the, the regulation of it has created uh, or, or initially created a very sort of uh, uber rigorous uh, technical entity um, that I think it has evolved effectively uh, away from. It's not quite uh, as bureaucratic, but that bureaucratic entity was really a construct of how it was uh, defined uh, and, and regulated, in my view. Um, I think that 
that we need an entity that is nimble to sort of act as the conductor uh, across these sectors um, and, and one that is really engaged and, and has a thoughtful approach to community participation um, there. So I, I'm, I think that we're, we're in a situation where we need coordination. We need uh, the state of Vermont to step up and provide um, a, a, a baseline. You described it nicely, uh, Senator Bray, as, as you know, a version of the Common App for Colleges. Um, a, a single place where, uh, you know, a Vermonter can go to a website or sit down with a, a, a caseworker and sort of, you know, input the data that establishes where they are uh, on the continuum of, of uh, income or need um, that program providers then can access and, and use in a way that provides the consumer a dignified experience while they're accessing sliding scale incentives. Um, and at the same time, uh, it's efficient, it's auditable, um, it's confidential uh, and respectful. Senator Westman. So um, you bring up a whole sea of questions um, as you talk about that. Um, I know you have counselors now out there doing that work, and I think the committee should probably hear some about that. But, um, and particularly with lower income, it's the CAP agencies that are the frontline face of that. As you talk about this though, does OEO have, they're concentrated on um, low income and helping um, um, people with income security. Does OEO, as they work with the CAP agencies, look at the issue of um, um, carbon and, um, and the reduction in carbon in the reduction of energy use? So when they, as they're handing out money and they're coordinating the efforts of the CAP agencies. So I, I will preface my remarks by saying I have a relatively narrow relationship with OEO as a weatherization provider. And, and yep. OEO is a diverse organization that does a lot of different things. And I don't pretend to be expert in the breadth of their uh, work. I, I do believe that OEO, like most regulators responds to the metrics handed to them by their funders. And, uh, and carbon is not a metric for uh, the, the weatherization program. Uh, it, we only recently started actually cal calculating it, but, but we use savings to investment ratio. We use hard, economic criteria for decision-making. Um, and, uh, you know, within that, we have a lot of uh, investment in health and safety, but that health and safety is all towards enabling us to go after cost-effective energy-saving measures. And I think uh, the same has historically been true on the on the public service side, that they tend towards, you know, ROI, uh, you know, return on investment, savings to investment ratio, cost effectiveness is a is a really critical metric, and that's that. Uh, it's why most of our services, uh, uh, why people with means tend to adopt clean energy technologies much faster, is because they're putting putting a portion of the bill, so the return on investment for public investment looks really good. Um, so uh, yes, community action provides counseling. Um, it does not provide counseling that takes into account uh, the carbon impact or fossil fuel use. Um, you know, we are uh, able to support people with wood 
but that's really through programming from the Clean Energy Development Fund. Um, more often than not, we're going to go in and try and, you know, just make a fossil fuel heating appliance operate at its most efficient. Um, it drives me crazy, but, you know, there's rules handed down that really come from the feds originally that, you know, if we have to replace a furnace because of, say, a cracked heat exchanger, we have to replace it with the technology that was there. So if it was a, uh, it's called barometrically or, or, you know, if it was a, if it was a appliance that used a chimney before, we can't put in a direct vent appliance that would be much more efficient and safer in the building because we have to replace with the technology that was there. Um, I digress. Uh, you know, going up back to the high level, um, OEO would need to be tasked with considering carbon in order to really add that to uh, their guiding principles. And, and, you know, personally, I would advocate for the legislature to do that. Um, uh, I personally and professionally, I think, I think that, you know, the time has come for that. And, you know, as all sectors of the economy, as all sectors of government need to look at how they can uh, help us manage and advance in the carbon challenge, the climate challenge, that the, the time has come. So, so what you're saying is we should um, um, instruct uh, OEO to include um, carbon reduction as part of their overall goals? I believe so, yes. Okay. Okay. And, um, you know, one, part of our conversation in Act 62 and other bills in the last two years has been redefining efficiency on the electric side and, and as we expand into thermal and um, transportation as lowest cost per CO2 equivalent avoided or reduced, as opposed to um, just replacing, uh, looking at kilowatt hour charges, for instance, yeah. is a megawatt cheaper than a, another clean watt, you know, that kind of thing. So I think we're in a, we're in a transition to something that is founded on the compelling thing for us to address, which is emissions. So. Yeah, I, I think that cost per ton avoided is a, is a great metric, um, but I think that you have to evaluate it by income quintile or, or you know, it, that you need, to, you need to recognize that you can't have the same expectation for folks with means as you would have for uh, folks without means. And, and, uh, and design your programming to be sensitive to that. Great, thank you. Um, so we've bombarded you with questions and it's been very helpful, but I don't know if we've taken you, derailed you from getting to something that you actually wanted to share with us this morning. Well, I, I, think, um, I think I just wanna point out that, that the clean energy transition requires uh, risk and um, on many levels, and it can be financial risk, but it's also an emotional risk. And, and that uh, as Senator Messman articulated earlier, uh, that most effectively is managed with one-on-one -on -one relationships, trusted relationships. And uh, the historically, the entities that have focused on energy saving haven't uh, necessarily supported the, the, the softer side of this, the, the piece of it, which is helping people with financing, helping people uh, sort of understand what their options are um, and, and, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a long play that, that, you know, with transportation, so much of our, our desires around the vehicle we drive are driven by not necessarily our needs. And, 
Um, so incentive structures that, that, you know, respect that, but at the same time, uh, encourage people to make the uncomfortable choice, um, I think are, are really, really important in the long haul um, and enable good uh, relationship is, is a critical piece. Okay, great. Um, you said one thing before we um, move on. Could, uh, if I wrote it down, I phrased it. You said people who work uh, with, um, with counselors of any sort on this kind of, these challenges we're talking about should have a dignified experience, which is an expression that really resonates with me. Can you say a little bit more about what goes on, maybe unintentionally, that's not dignified versus what you're aspiring to? Yeah, I know. I know. Well, um, the, 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 you know, I, I spoke to this last time we were together, you know, it's an eight page weatherization application to access weatherization for somebody who's less than 80% of median income, but it's, you check a box to access a similar dollar volume in order to purchase an electric vehicle if you're 120% of median income, oh. so, you know, just, uh, yeah. that, that the, 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 the point of transaction, um, needs to, uh, allow a consumer who has, is eligible for benefits to access them without, uh, embarrassment or shame or, uh, having to sort of, you know, bear their soul. And and uh, and and engage, you know, clerks across the table in the the intimate financial matters in their life. Great. Well, thank you once again for uh, coming in, Senator Westman. Last I would just say any recommendations you had about strengthening those one-on-one. -on -one um, relationships and what um, further goes on now um, in um, the CAP agencies would also be helpful. And Senator McCormick. Thanks. Um, your last comment there about uh, a dignified ex experience, uh, would that require legislation or can that just be done as a change of procedure? by the practitioners? Uh, I'm not a lawyer, I don't know. Um, the, the, you know, my view is that if we had a, an, an entity of the state, I, I'm gonna just throw out there AHS that, that took their, their system and said, you know, here's a website, you input your information into it. And that information is both around income as well as assets. Um, because we have a number of Vermonters who choose to draw very low incomes, but actually have substantial assets. And I think that we need to recognize that a little differently when we're talking about, you know, large physical investments in a building. Um, that, uh, you know, that one entity sort of collects the information and uh, s establishes where somebody is on this continuum. And I, my preference is not to use A, B, C, or D, or one, two, three, or four. Um, maybe it's color coded, I don't know. Um, but, but, you know, you, you go through that process once and then that designation, you can carry that to, Efficiency Vermont for incentives on home performance. You can carry it to the the uh, the land trusts or neighbor works in terms of accessing resources for uh, working on a home at the time of purchase. You can carry it to the car dealer 
to access incentives at the time you're accessing a car. Um, you can use it with your utility uh, if you are eligible for uh, rates that are income sensitive. So um, instead of each of all those providers having to go through its own process, it can utilize something that the state has already done and, uh, and that it is uh, common and equitable across all parties. Great. Um, all right, I don't see any other committee questions or comments. Thank you as always for a thoughtful visit with the committee. And um, Senator yeah. Westman is, he's good at giving people assignments. So I don't know if you had, if you were asking uh well, I appreciate that. I, well, the question is, uh, you know, I know they offer counseling, but um, I don't know how to strengthen it. And it would seem to me that if you're going to deal with somebody um, um, in a dignified way, it would be one on one discussing their particular problems, not coming down on high. And um, so if the cap agencies are already doing that. How do I strengthen that? And okay. that's the place that we have to get into. Right. Um, Mr. Zabriskie, is that something you could give some thought to and oh, I, 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 back to the I, committee? I, 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 Sue Minter had wanted to join us this morning and had a, a family situation that she could not, but uh, she would be all over this and-, and Okay. Um, and so, yes, we will come back to you with recommendations. Um, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. I'd love to have Thanks. Sue come in if um, that pleased the chair. Well, we've invited her already, but well, you know, like, I'd love like to have happens. her come in if that pleased the chair. Right. We'll all get together for coffee um, that, <laughs> in the future. Um, you, you know, the, uh, so great, let's leave it there for now uh, where there's a lot more to do, but the conversation is a, a good one about making genuine improvements. So thank you again. Thank um, you. And with that, we'll invite Mr. Duval to join us and then that'll take us through a break. Don't speed, just be, we're running a little long, but it's because we're having good conversations and discussion this morning. So um, I think the timing will work out. Don't, you don't have to say, wait, there's only five minutes left <laughs> and go. So. Okay, thank, thank you, Chairman Bray and members of the committee. Good to be with you again. Um, as you've turned, as you're turning your focus more to um, some of the transportation side of the energy and emissions and energy burden uh, equation, um, we, you know, we are right now Energy Action Network in the midst, in the process of developing our next annual progress report for uh, Vermont on energy emissions, the economy and equity, and have been doing some uh, research um, to expand our understanding of the um, transportation equity issues, including some of the, the questions that came up earlier from Senator Westman uh, in particular about, um, you know, how different income groups of, of Vermonters or, um, you know, are, are facing some of these, these costs and what some of the opportunities might be. So I, I'm really here to share some, uh, uh, you know, some of that information that we have been collecting. As I think you all know, um, as I stated previously, EAN, the organization, as a backbone organization of a small staff of three, we really exist to do two things. One is to collect and present the highest quality and latest available data to ensure that our conversations in Vermont on our energy emissions and economic future are evidence-based and their data and analysis informed. Um, then later you'll, you will hear from some subgroups of our network that have um, organized themselves um, around particular opportunities that, um, that they want to share uh, with you. But I'm gonna just start with some of that data and analysis. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, uh, 
Um, and, you know, I, I mostly have these early slides in here for the record. Um, I'm going to go through them very quickly as a recap um, of what we discussed last time, but I'm going to spend most of my time on the, on the new material. And of course, you know, any clarifications, please don't hesitate to uh, interrupt or ask me to, to pause and we can pause on something. So um, transportation emissions currently about 45%. That number has is likely increasing. We don't have the next emissions inventory. In testimony, you heard a couple of weeks ago from the Public Service Department, they were pegging that number as maybe 47% of Vermont's total emissions as of 2018. We will wait to see what the next comprehensive inventory says, but clearly it's our largest um, and it's, you know, it's a much higher share of our emissions than the nation as, as a whole. And it's been our biggest increase since the 1990 baseline, over a million metric tons increase in our transportation emissions comparing 1990 to the latest available data from 2016. Um, and that's a big reason why we have the highest per capita greenhouse gas emissions of any state in the Northeast. Um, and you know our vehicle miles traveled in Vermont, again, are higher than any other state in the region. This has been increasing over the past five years. Um, and we will have updated uh, data uh, in our next report. It's, I think it's somewhere now even higher than this, around like 11,800 uh, miles traveled per year. We'll break that down actually by, by income shortly. We've talked about the uh, increasing pref uh, consumer preferences for CUVs, SUVs, and pickup trucks and the declining share of new vehicle uh, purchases and leases that are uh, passenger cars. Um, and we've talked about, you know, the lower costs for fueling uh, or charging EVs versus uh, the, the fuel and the maintenance costs for gas and diesel vehicles. So with that quick overview, here's, here's the new part. I, I first want to say whenever um, I start uh, doing some research about transportation and energy in Vermont, the first stop I make is the latest Vermont transportation energy profile that VTrans produces. It is a wealth of very in-depth and comprehensive uh, information. Um, I've, we had many conversations with Dan Dutcher from VTrans about this and Jonathan Dowds at the UVM Transportation Research Center is, uh, who, who's the lead author of this report is also an incredible um, asset. So questions about transportation and energy, that is a, a great starting point and in, um, in very in-depth. Um, one of the things, uh, Jared, sorry to yeah. interrupt. Could you send that to uh, Jude and we could post it on our website and distribute it to committee members? Because I don't think that's something we usually see. Thank you. Yes, will do. Thank you. Um, just making my note. Um, so one of the things, though, that we have wanted to know, to learn more about is kind of transportation equity issues. What are the, the cost differences um, that different income groups of, of Vermonters face? And so, you know, we've started this work, you know, with the same energy burden analysis that Efficiency Vermont um, has helped develop and presented on so well earlier, um, and, and have looked at their report. One of the things you'll note from that report and from, their pre from Dan and Kelly's presentation this morning is that they're primarily looking at kind of the, the geographic distribution of expenses and, and burden and kind of how that varies by region and by town. Um, so to build on that great work and, and to kind of complement it, we decided to, uh, that we wanted to look at what this would look like by income group. Um, and so we've worked with a, an incredibly talented um, a summer intern of, of ours from this summer who's continued working with us in the fall. Um, her name is Jenna Slayton. She's a quantitative social sciences major, a senior at Dartmouth College. And a lot of the graphs that um, I will share are thanks to her good work. Um, so we started by wanting to look at Vermont. Um, and our starting point was the National Household Travel Survey. Um, and one of the challenges there I will note up front is that um, to do an add-on or to have an, a state as an add-on partner, that's, that's it is I should say, it is necessary for Vermont to be an add-on partner to this national study to get sample sizes that are high enough for us to have confidence in the results being applicable to uh, if, if we wanna make state-specific statements about Vermont. The last time that Vermont was specifically sampled for this survey, um, was 2009. However, 
the latest national household travel survey was done in 2017 and Vermont was not an add-on partner. So our Vermont specific data is, is pretty old here. Um, the way that the best way that we have been able to find to try to get at the question of, of the closest representation to Vermont that we could from this latest survey um, was looking at the results of the respondents from rural nor folks who are rural residents um, in the Northeast. Um, so um, here though, I'll just state the last available data we have for Vermont shows the differences in cost uh, for vehicle fuel expenditures by income group um, and whether or not um, where their kind of location is, are they rural residents or urban residents? And what we see is that upper income Vermonters, and again, this was back in 2009, were spending and consuming a lot more transportation fuels than, than lower income Vermonters were. And also that as we would expect, rural Vermonters were um, um, consuming more, expending more um, on transportation fuels than kind of more urban Vermonters. Um, this is, is that updated look that looks at the, the Northeast rural um, or Northeast urban versus rural. And we see that um, region wide, the, the same thing is very true. The, the highest income folks are um, buying a lot more um, vehicle fuels and, and lower income folks less. Um, you know, sometimes half as, half as much, about $2,000 a year, for instance, for rural Northeastern uh, folks who are in that um, lowest income group of less than $25,000 a year, whereas you know, they're, those who are making over 150,000 are, are um, spending over $4,000 uh, a year on their transportation fuels. But very similar to what we heard from Kelly and Dan earlier, um, just because upper income folks are spending more and their expenditures are higher, the share of income and the energy burden is much, much higher for lower income folks. Again, this is Vermont specific, so it goes back to 2009. But what we see here is that, especially for rural Vermonters who, whose income was less than $20,000 a year, you know, they're spending over 25% of their income on, on vehicle fuel costs. Um, and of course, the, you know, the energy burden of, of transportation fuel costs is higher for those lower income groups as opposed to upper income groups, even though they're, they're buying a lot more of it. it. Again, reflective of overall trends in economic and wealth inequality at the state level, the national level, and internationally. Um, this is what those uh, fuel expenditure, uh, the kind of energy burden of transportation fuels looks like if we, if we look across the Northeast in, in rural versus urban communities. Similar, but not, you know, we were looking at over 25% of uh, income spent on vehicle fuels on the lowest income folks in Vermont uh, back in 2009. Um, we, don't, we don't have that data for Vermont for 2017. And it, you know, this is more like 9% um, for rural Northeast in particular. My, my hope is that the next time there is a national household uh, travel survey, that Vermont is an add-on partner so that we can have more state-specific data to help inform our discussions. Um, so to recap, lower income folks um, spending a lot less uh, overall on transportation fuels, but a much higher share of their income. This uh, gets to the um, point that Senator McDonald was, was bringing up earlier in terms of the average age of, of vehicles uh, broken down by income. Uh, again, this is rural Northeast. So those folks whose household uh, income, you know, is, is lower, say the lowest income folks in the region, less than $25,000 a year, the average vehicle age is, um, you know, about 12 years old. Um, whereas upper income folks, uh, the average age of the vehicle is much lower, oftentimes around eight years old. Uh, so big differences in terms of the cost of, of maintenance and you know what what um, Paul Zabrisky was just talking about in terms of that unex those unexpected expenses that can pop up any time in terms of a big repair bill. Clearly, you know those are more likely to happen in these these older vehicles that lower income folks are disproportionately um, uh, have access to and utilizing. Interestingly, we did not find big differences in terms of 
um, the fuel efficiency, the average fuel efficiency of the vehicles that um, are, are used by different income groups. There's, there's slight differences, but, but you know, relative to some of these overall differences, they, they are not large. Um, and you know, the other thing that we see is big diff, we were talking about vehicle miles traveled in Vermont's kind of overall state average uh, across the entire population about 11,800 miles per traveled per year, there are big differences in that amount of travel by income group. Um, you know, folks who are making over a hundred uh, over a hundred thousand dollars a year on average are traveling, you know, every one of those groups over that amount is traveling over 15,000 uh, miles a year on, on average as, as, a, as a group there. Whereas lower income folks are, are driving less um, I think people are, are surprised by this sometimes because we assume that because of our settlement pattern and sometimes lower cost housing in areas that are outside of downtowns and village centers, um, we assume that lower income people are traveling more. Clearly, um, there, there, are there are longer average commutes for folks who, who live away from downtowns and village centers to get to work or to school, but there's so much kind of discretionary travel or um, kind of, you know, travel for, you know, pleasure or other reasons that is happening by upper income Vermonters that is, that is not happening as much among lo lower income folks. And I should say in the, the rural Northeast, this is rural Northeast data. And, you know, a point that I've often heard Paul Zabriskie make in the past that I fully agree with and think is worth making in this context is this conversation isn't all about reducing energy use. There are, there are many Vermonters, many folks in rural, the rural Northeast who, you know, may not be able to travel as many miles as, as they want or need to, to get to, you know, fundamental services. And so I, I just think that it is important to remember that for some low income folks, these lower numbers on vehicle miles traveled or uh, the, the amount of money they're spending on energy, whether it's vehicle fuel or whether it's heating fuels, sometimes um, those folks need to be supported and enabled to use more energy to meet basic needs or to, to meet basic kind of comfort in the, in the case of weatherization. Um, and a lot of the responsibility uh, needs to be on upper income folks who are using more energy and causing more pollution. Um, this is one of the other um, graphs that, that we found from the National Household Travel Survey, and it was a cost per mile traveled of different vehicle types. Um, and this really reveals how you can get massive savings for you know, drivers of hybrid or electric vehicles compared to the gas or diesel counterparts. You know, with, with the average cost per mile traveled over twice as much for a diesel vehicle as compared to hybrid and electric and, you know, and significantly more for, for gas vehicles than hybrid and electric. This, this relates to um, a recent study that just came out in November of last year. I love this study for many reasons. I'll just take a moment of personal privilege here to say that um, I love the cover of this report because it actually features my father's old house. This is very near. I assumed it was in Senator McDonald's uh, district because it's way it's through the it's 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 village, even though it's, it's Orange County, Caledonia. it's in Caledonia, uh, the Caledonia <laughs> district, but it's, it's right nearby. My father lived in Waits River Village for a long time in this uh, house until he passed away. Uh, but this was what the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, chose for the cover of their report, uh, just serendipitously. Um, and what they specifically looked at was um, the opportunities for uh, cost savings for uh, drivers in Maine, Vermont, Virginia, and Maryland. So this was a great study because it really specifically looked at Vermont. Um, and one of the things that they found was that the savings are even greater for rural drivers because that cost per mile is lower. And when rural drivers are driving more miles and have higher um, uh, kind of transportation expenses, they were finding that on average, rural drivers can expect to save $1,900 per year uh, by driving EVs. This is a great report that I recommend. I, I provided it, the link previously um, in my testimony a couple of weeks ago. Um, 
But that is that is looking at fuel and, and maintenance costs. There is also this really important question of the upfront cost of, of some of these vehicles. And one of the things that I often hear that I get a little bit, um, I think deserves more nuance is, is folks will talk about how EVs are more expensive um, than gas vehicles. And um, I think oftentimes people are just looking at the manufacturer's suggested retail price, the MSRP, the upfront uh, price before incentives. And because of uh, important focus and program development by the federal and state governments, the, you know, even if that is, you know, so we'll just take this example. This was developed by Drive Electric Vermont, research done by Dave Roberts. They are the single best resource on, um, you know, electric vehicle um, kind of analysis and information. You know, the upfront cost of a Nissan LEAF is $31,600 in a Nissan Sentra is a very comparable gas car. That upfront price is nine, a little over 19,000. You just look at those costs, people will say an electric vehicle is more expensive, but because of uh, federal programs, state programs, manufacturers, discounts, utilities, incentives, many of the programs that you have been involved in shaping, the price after incentives is can be far lower and is often far lower for the electric vehicles um, than the comparable uh, gas models. And, you know, even if lower income folks cannot take advantage of this federal tax credit because they don't have the tax liability for it, um, we are seeing a lot of folks choosing to lease because the full value of that can be passed on to a lower or moderate income uh, person in a lower lease cost. We're seeing many uh, EVs. The two best selling in the state right now are the Nissan Leaf and the Chevy Bolt. And we're seeing lease deals for them as low as $100 a month, sometimes $129 a month, sometimes $200 a month. Um, so the incentives um, are, matter and are making a difference. And I think that if we're going to talk about the relative costs of these vehicles, it's important to look at the price after incentives. Um, so the six initial takeaways from this um, research that, that we've been doing on kind of transportation equity issues and transportation costs by income group, upper income Vermonters consume more transportation fuel than lower income Vermonters. But of course, as we see in other energy areas, lower income Vermonters are spending a far higher share of their income on transportation fuels. Uh, the lowest income rural uh, Northeastern drivers are driving vehicles about 12 years old um, versus upper income folks in the region whose average vehicle age is about eight years old. Um, and, you know, upper income rural Northeast drivers drive many more miles uh, than the lowest income Northeast drivers. Um, it's much, on average, the difference between those higher and that lowest income group of over 5,000 miles a year. Um, electric and hybrid vehicles are much less expensive to drive per mile. Uh, given the fuel and maintenance savings they provide and can be a major source of ongoing savings for low and moderate income Vermonters whose uh, budgets are stretched thin and, and challenged, especially in these times. And finally, that after incentives, many EVs are already less expensive upfront um, than comparable gas models. And uh, the work that you all are doing on kind of program design incentive policy makes is, is very important in terms of those calculations. Um, that is most of, of what I have initially. Um, and then I would, I guess, um, um, I just want to, I guess, before the break, I'll introduce um, the fact that, you know, this last fall in October, we had a, a statewide, a network wide uh, virtual summit. Um, about 250 folks from our network, state agency partners, legislators participated. And in advance of that, we put a call out to all of our members. And we said, you know, the Global Warming Solutions Act is, is now law. We are legally bound to achieve emissions reductions requirements as a state. We wanna make sure that we do that, but also that we do so equitably. And so we asked, folks to put forward the best ideas they could identify as collaborative teams for how to rapidly, significantly, and equitably reduce um, greenhouse gas pollution in Vermont. Um, we had 20 proposals come in, 10 were selected to present at the summit, and then the network members um, voted on which ones that they wanted to see um, 
move forward um, and, and receive some initial funding support to get kind of seed uh, ideas or proof of concept programs or, or kind of initial uh, policy design options on the table. Um, four were selected, uh, two that were focused on the transportation sector and two on the thermal sector. Um, you've already heard about the weatherization at scale initiatives and I believe you will hear it about the clean heat standard um, effort underway uh, to, with the thermal uh, focus. But on the transportation side, really lucky to have the groups that have been leading uh, the effort, um, the chairs and co-chairs of both the uh, Future of Rural Transit and Replace Your Ride. They were the winning pitches at, at our summit and have had really dedicated uh, collaborative teams developing um, those proposals um, over the past few months. And so that's, that's what will, uh, my understanding, come next in your agenda today. I just want to clarify that, um, you know, there, there is a, a distinction that is important, that I, I, I think is important to remember about EAN, the organization versus EAN, the network. And that is that EAN, the nonprofit organization, the backbone, we exist to do the tracking and the analysis and serve as a neutral convener. We do not take uh, positions on specific bills or specific funding amounts. We, we don't do any lobbying of, of, of that sort. However, there are group network members and subgroups of our network that will um, organize amongst themselves to say, we think this policy is best, or we recommend this uh, funding amount. And that's you know a perfectly appropriate recommendation or request to come from those groups, but it does not necessarily reflect um, the, the views for or against of EAN, the nonprofit organization that serves a very broad and diverse network that has members that sometimes agree and sometimes disagree. So I just wanna make that um, point clear up front. Uh, sure. Well, thank you for the, uh, the update uh, with the transportation data and setting us up for this, as well as preparing the, the floor for the presentations we're gonna have. So, uh, We'll take a break because we've been going an hour and a half straight. Uh, uh, so it's 10.02. Uh, I don't wanna short anyone on the 15 minutes. So at 10.17, we'll start again and we'll finish the morning with the presentations that we have. Um, so, uh, and then the, the standard reminder is uh, while we're on break, uh, the Signal continues to stream to YouTube, so I recommend that everyone uh, stop their video and mute their microphone while we're on break. Um, thanks again, Mr. Duval, for getting us ready for the second half.
Okay, 1017. One, two, three. All right, we're back. Um, thank you, everyone. Thank you to our, our guests for um, uh, taking, giving us the time to have a break. Um, and before we uh, pick up with uh, our guests uh, for the second half of the morning, I just wanted to pause because we've been taking in a lot of information and um, so I would say like uh, just for clarity for ourselves in terms of what are we doing I'm uh, we're going to be writing a bill together originally uh, I had asked Luke to draft a bill that was quite different which I've really ended up um, striking and I've been rewriting my outline for that bill based on what we've been hearing over the last three plus weeks. Um, what's also happened is that uh, some new things to address have come out of it. One is uh, the need, even if we're not doing a deep dive um, answering transportation needs yet, um, any kind of overarching plan for doing better on a, uh, managing emissions ought to create a framework that anticipates we'll do more over time on transportation. And so I think what I'd like to be doing with you all in the next several weeks to make crossover with this bill, et cetera, is to um, design that framework that we've talked about the money piece and we're gonna be coming back to this next week. We said, if we're gonna receive money in an increasing different from an, a growing number of different sources, it needs to be rationalized in terms of receiving it, allocating it, and then monitoring for performance so that we have uh, a nimble infrastructure that can help support that ecosystem of partners. And then we heard this morning that there's a, a need for more coordination and I think something we've heard across many different issues, that sort of notion of one-stop shopping, uh, making it just easier for people to participate. And then I particularly uh, appreciate the part of this morning's conversation that addressed um, the sensitivity that goes along with working uh, with lower income Vermonters to make it a positive empowering experience for them, not that they're showing up sort of quote unquote, to get help. Um, there's, there are ways to do it that make people feel better and stronger and more capable. Um, so let's aim for that. So, uh, so that's, what's, that's what we're up to. Um, we will write as a committee the bill to do this. And so now I'd like to turn to, um, as we're thinking more about transportation, to hear um, from presenters who who had the two quote unquote winning pitches, uh, which was uh, uh, at the EAN summit from this fall. Um, so, and this also provides us one last comment. It provides us with uh, some background that I think will help us work with transportation committee members um, more this throughout the biennium we know that there's an opportunity to do more there. So with that, I'd like to welcome to the table. I see uh, Ms. Robachek is listed first on the, on the um, uh, agenda, but I leave it to you all to decide amongst yourselves who's going first and you can tag team the time. Uh, so I'm not, uh, I'm not seeing anyone's square turn into faces yet. We're here we go. Good morning. Good Sorry. morning. I've got Good the morning. message. I should go first. <laughs> okay. Um, 
So um, my name is Jennifer Wallace Broder. I work for VEIC in the consulting division of the organization and I lead the clean transportation group. And I've been fortunate to connect with many of you over the years on um, transportation issues and most recently on elect uh, vehicle electrification. Um, but today I'm wearing my hat as the chair of the steering committee for one of the EAN selected projects called the Future of Rural Transit. Um, so I was going to share sort of what we're um, thinking about related to that project and some of the work that we've done so far and anticipate doing over the next year. So um, I will share my screen now and pull up my slide deck. Good to see you again. Yeah, it's nice to see all of you. And let me just get to my, get this bar off of here so I can show my, I hate that full presentation. Let's see if I can get to that. Okay. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, the future of rural transit, shifting the conversation that you've been having so far this morning from personal vehicles to our um, public transit systems. Um, so I think that many of you are aware um, that we have two public transportation systems in the state of Vermont. We have the public transit system that supports the general public, those who um, are challenged uh, with mobility that can't drive or can't uh, afford a vehicle and rely on public transit to get to their daily, to their jobs or to the services they need. And then we have school transportation, um, which is also a public transportation system targeted to school children um, and getting them to school. And so there, I think if anybody has participated in a transportation forum in the community, there's a perennial idea that is constantly surfaced, which is our school buses travel all over the state and they travel on rural roads and what why can't i get on that bus what if we were able to access those um, trips um, that are particularly challenging for public transit to offer in some cases um, so this um, group came together to really sort of dive into that idea um, and and try to take it to the next level so what we're really looking at as a team is whether we can expand transportation options for rural communities by offering combined bus services to schools and community members using electric buses. So we are trying to really think about all the ways in which we can provide greater efficiencies to Vermonters, um, including taxpayers, um, and people who are relying on these services. So we think that there are a number of benefits um, to this. Um, there's the potential to reduce transportation costs by combining services to schools and, um, and also to Vermonters um, who uh, could potentially take a bus if the service was more robust rather than operating their own personal vehicle. Um, we think there's an opportunity to potentially inc uh, increase uh, mobility options by closing gaps in current service, um, either for school um, children, um, particularly for uh, uh, things like after school sports, where they might not be able to get back and forth on the regular bus, um, or to Vermonters who rely on public transportation, but routes don't serve them um, completely. We also think that um, by bringing in the concept of electrification, um, that you can improve health by reducing exposure to diesel fumes. And um, we can also reduce emissions overall. Um, I think um, we should acknowledge that public transportation is a carbon reduction strategy in and of itself. Um, the more people that take transit, the fewer people are in their car by themselves. And that's a really important way that we can uh, reduce emissions um, by operating fewer and maybe fuller buses. We also can um, uh, make those vehicles more efficient, um, both in terms of the number of rides they're uh, providing, but also in um, the number of buses in general that are operating. And by making them zero emission, we can reduce um, the carbon impact as well. So one thing I wanna um, point out, uh, we 
And we've done a lot of research over the past year on this concept. And at a certain point, we were really at this inflection point of, are we going to combine services by providing public transportation on school buses or to provide school transportation on public transit and through the public transit system? And we made a decision to go uh, down the path of um, assessing the viability or the feasibility of providing school transportation on public transit buses. Um, there are a few reasons that we went this way, but if we're ultimately looking at creating a more efficient system um, and com actually combining service, we feel like the public transit system is um, uh, better suited to support that. Um, it is federally funded. It is coordinated at the state level. There's service that's not going away in the state. We would not propose putting um, the general public on school buses and getting rid of public transit buses um, where we could see that more likely solution of getting students onto public transit. Um, it's already happening in Burlington. It happens across the country. So there's precedent for that in many places. Um, the idea of putting the public on school buses is a, li is a little bit more challenging, but I'd be happy to you know, have you test our assumptions on that? We are definitely in a learning mode, but I wanted to make that clear um, from the outset. So we are very much in the information gathering stage. Um, we think that there's something to this idea. As I mentioned, it's brought up quite frequently. We think there's a lot of potential benefits. Um, so we've been working together. We have a steering committee. I am the chair of that steering committee, but we have very active partners, many of them who are on this call today. Um, so you can see the members of the steering committee here, but we also have um, a lot of organizations that are participating as advisors to the project. Um, many of them represent Vermonters who are challenged to get to the places they need on a regular basis because they are people with disabilities or older and don't um, uh, can't drive. Um, there are others, um, low-income Vermonters that can't afford a car or are challenged um, to afford a reliable car. And then we also have others that are interested in participating because of um, the uh, potential carbon benefits. Um, notably, oh, we have uh, yeah. Your, your sorry, slide deck is not requested. We're still on your opening slide, just so you know. Oh, okay. I'm not quite sure what to do about that because <laughs> I'm on my own slide. Uh, let's see. Sorry about that. Um, no. I don't know if there's, maybe it would be better for. We can always, if we have it, we can always just. You do have it. So we can follow yeah. along right here. Okay. With that, should I just shut this down and should I stop sharing uh, and have sure. the committee do it? Okay. Sure, we all have it on our committee page. Okay, Thank so you. I'm on slide four, which is the program okay. partners. And I'm gonna stop sharing because I have it in front of me. So that's uh, slide uh, four shows the partners. Um, I did wanna note that we are, um, we have been engaging um, transit agencies and the Superintendents Association and VTrans in this conversation. So um, they are really key stakeholders and um, there is uh, interest in um, uh, working with us to further this concept. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, I can share with you what's happened so far. So as I mentioned, um, Partners have been meeting for over a year to really investigate sort of the past studies that have been done on this concept, um, other projects. So the, notably the Wyndham Regional Planning Commission did a, um, a really uh, great white paper um, assessing sort of the legal issues, the cultural issues, the technical issues related to combining services. And that was a really great piece of information for us to tap into. And I'm happy to share that if people are interested in that. Um, Senator McCormick might be aware that the town of Ludlow also provided um, combined service um, for a period of time. 
Um, it was locally supported, so not part of the statewide public transportation system, which I think created some challenges in providing robust service to all residents, perhaps, but maybe you have some <laughs> insights into that. <laughs> um, I, I always had mixed feelings about it because it, it was clearly a dodge, a way to dodge Act 60. Well, but, I didn't want to say that, but, but, <laughs> but, but it may, but it also made sense for other reasons. First of all, commutation to and from the ski area of workers to and from the ski area. It did that. And, and it, um, it, it just in general seemed to make sense. Just the, the general idea of, of blending them, having empty buses run is, is awful. It's a, just a waste. Right. So we're aware of that project, um, have some debrief on that, what worked, what didn't. Um, and um, so we also uh, did the pitch to the EAN to um, uh, generate interest in the idea and potential funding, which we were able to secure through that process. And we've also received a mobility and transportation innovations grant from VTrans. This was a program that was established um, in the fall session of the legislature. And we applied for funding to further research the idea and received a small grant to do that. Um, so if you want to go to the next slide, um, we are, um, we've developed an action plan for 2021. Um, our goals are to engage state, regional, and local stakeholders um, on the concept, um, sharing the idea and getting input, um, questions about barriers and possible solutions to those barriers. Um, we, uh, as I mentioned, the city of Burlington currently offers combined uh, transportation through Green Mountain Transit, uh, Transit for students. Um, um, so we are uh, seeking to learn more about how that works um, and also to get input from community members on um, how they feel about that, particularly parents. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, the Montpelier My Ride program, which is an on-demand um, pilot in Montpelier, um, to see um, what does it mean to offer more flexible um, tran uh, transit service, and can this be something that would uh, be uh, helpful? Um, is this something that could potentially contribute to our thinking about how a program could be set up? We are currently in the process of identifying rural regions in which we could do further analysis on the costs and benefits and test the concept with community members. So a letter has gone out to the Vermont Superintendents Association list um, trying to identify school districts that might be interested in this, uh, testing out this concept. We have um, received several uh, uh, indications from school districts that they'd be interested in participating in this. And we've also been doing outreach through RPCs um, and through the EAM process and have um, uh, also uh, identified regions that are interested. So we're in the process of trying to identify regions um, and have developed a set of criteria that we'll um, be using to select uh, promising areas to test the idea. Um, we will also want to develop a pilot program that could be implemented in 2022 in the following years and um, also would like to secure funding and um, to support a pilot if um, our research uh, indicates that this is something that we want to continue to pursue. So going on to the next slide, and thank you, Cara, <laughs> for sharing. Um, so as I mentioned, um, this is a bit of an overview. Uh, we are focused on outreach and education um, to identify those partners that I mentioned to re um, uh, and research the existing service, the Montpelier project. So I think this is a bit of a repeat. So I think we can go to the next one. And I did wanna share, um, so VEIC's role in the project in addition to providing leadership to the steering committee is to do th that cost benefit analysis that I mentioned. So once we identify a region or two that we think is promising to sort of evaluate this, we're gonna um, do a more in-depth study on um, what it means to combine um, services. Um, would we get the savings that we're anticipating in terms of um, you know, reducing costs to the school uh, reducing costs to um, uh, taxpayers um, 
would uh, combining services actually expand um, trips to more Vermonters? Um, how could we quantify the savings um, to the fleets um, and through EV adoption? Um, we'd want to understand the emissions and energy uh, reductions. And, as, um, and then th with any kind of transformative shift like there, this, there's, um, there are unintended consequences. So what might those be? Would there be impacts to, um, to current um, people offering these services? Um, and then we'd also want to understand if routes can be served by electric buses. Um, that's something that the EIC does frequently and um, have a strong muscle in that. So we'd also want to be looking at regions where electrification could support service. Next slide. So um, after completing that research, if we feel that the concept is viable, we'd be looking for an area in which we would actually pilot the combined service, um, looking at a, um, providing a couple of routes. Um, when we look at this, um, we are now looking at probably expansion of public transit routes and VTrans has been extremely helpful in providing information about how you create new routes that we're incorporating into our thinking on this. Um, and we'd want to obviously have a data collection plan to evaluate the project um, and develop sort of key metrics that would be important to understand. Um, uh, from VTrans perspective and the transit system perspective, um, uh, they do have a three-year pilot period where they test new routes. Um, so if a transit agency proposes a new route, um, and has um, all of the supporting um, documentation to support creation of a new route, they then test it for three years before they make it permanent. So we wanna align with that process as much as possible. A quick so, question, what is yeah. a cutaway? A cutaway is a small um, public transit bus. So for those of you who live in rural areas, you're not seeing those full-size buses traveling around your communities, the smaller ones, you might see vans or what, the picture there is a good example. It's it's just a small, it's a smaller transit bus. Thank you. That typically service, uh, that's what's typically operated through most of Vermont's rural areas. So I think that's my last slide. Um, so just wanted to open up for questions um, from the committee and um, absolutely would appreciate any insights or thoughts you might have that could help inform some of the questions that we're gonna be looking at um, this year. I have uh, uh, just sort of a background question. Do you know how big a fleet of school buses exist in the state of Vermont? Um, I know we've done a little bit of research on the total number of school buses in Vermont. It's about 400 to 450. Um, and I'm just gonna, if Cara, if Cara's got a better number, cause she really led that, um, just let me know, but that's sort of the overall size. I do wanna mention that um, there are um, different uh, operating models. Um, some school districts own and operate their own buses and some school districts contract for that service. And there's a variety of contractors that operate in the state of Vermont. We think that the, um, the opportunity at the outset is to look at schools that own and operate their own buses right now. Um, and as so that's one of the criteria we're probably going to consider um, for our initial regions. Okay. Well, it just seems like, uh, I don't know, this is an impression, a lay impression, that it's a, a significant investment, whether it's private or public, and a resource that sits still an awful lot of the time you know, by the time you factor in the summer. Now, maybe they're used more in the summer than I know to do other things, um, but. Yeah, I did wanna um, mention that we are, we, ha um, we are thinking about sort of more of the electrification issues than I um, mentioned in the presentation. So with electrification, I think you may be aware that there are opportunities for using um, particularly bus batteries as storage, um, and vehicle to grid opportunities. Um, that's something that we're gonna be um, trying to incorporate. Um, and so the, we do have some of the utilities at the table. 
um, as part of this conversation and we are aware that they are interested in that type of application for electric buses. I think the big question that we will have through this process is how, how um, school buses are more idle than public transit. So um, uh, it's certainly an application for school buses, but if you're looking at transit and hopefully having buses fully operational Throughout the day, um, it changes that um, consideration a little bit. So we're, we're going to be looking at sort of the, the opportunity in those scenarios for vehicle to grid. Okay. And are you, um, in terms of the, I don't, I don't know school budgets well enough to know off the top of my head how much of an expense item it is to uh, student transportation. Um, are you... I'm guessing you're looking into that as in terms of how uh, how it might be funded differently. I mean, it could take some pressure off school budgets, I suppose, if yeah. if these are shared resources, right? Yeah, so um, we think they're about two to three percent of school budgets. Um, but I think that we have heard from some superintendents that it's a cost that that is burdensome to them. And um uh, I always like to say schools are in the business of educating students. Um, fleet management is an add-on activity that isn't central to their mission sometimes. So, um, you know, being able to look at things like efficient vehicles um, or, you know, stuff like this is, is a little bit beyond their primary mission. So, um, I, you know, innovation in transport, school transportation is um, sometimes challenging to find capacity for. So I hope that we can sort of get underneath some of those things as we look at this project. Um, but it's uh, at least anecdotally, we've heard for from some school districts, it's a, you know, it's a burdensome cost and going up. Okay, great. Um, any other questions for Ms. Wallace Roger or Ms. Robichek? Okay. Well, thank you for. Yeah, I'm sorry about us. the slides. Uh, <laughs> no, no worries. We had them two ways, so we were all set. Good. All right. I'll stay on if there's any other questions that come up. Okay. Thank you thank very you. much. And with that, I'd like to move on to uh, our second set of guests, Ms. O'Neill, Ms. McGinnis. Good to see you. Um, the floor is yours. You can tag team it however you want to run the show. It's your thing. Great, great. Thank you. Um, so my name is Peggy O'Neill Vivanco. I am on the steering committee co-chair with Linda McGinnis. I am the Vermont Clean Cities Coordinator at UVM's Transportation Research Center. Um, so I'll take the, the slide deck here. Let me um, share my screen and hope I don't have... While Technical she's doing issues. That, I'll, I'll introduce myself while she's doing that. My name is Linda McGinnis. Um, I'm an economist. I'm a senior fellow at Energy Action Network, uh, former chair of the Clean Energy Development Fund uh, on the Climate Council, have worked in the realm of climate and energy for some time in Vermont, and I'm really pleased to be here. I love this session this morning. For an energy nerd, this was just like pure joy to listen to all the presentations and your excellent questions. So thank you for having us. Yes, um, so uh, this is my first time ever presenting to um, anyone in Montpelier, so uh, hang on, let me, so, be, so let me be patient. In and, <laughs> yeah, and no worries. So, you know, uh, you're doing us a favor by coming in. We, we, uh, we do better work when we engage and learn from more people from outside. So um, this, is, this aren't oral exams, these are, we're bringing in information and cooking in the room. So thanks for showing up to help us do this work together. Great, great, thank you. So um, because, because I'm last and I've been on since just before nine, I realized a lot of this information has already been covered. So um, at the risk of being, you know, 
redundant uh, in this kind of late hour, I'm gonna just quickly blow through very quickly with the Replace Your Ride program. We are trying to tackle transportation poverty, reducing the cost for low and moderate income Vermonters, as um, Jared Duvall pointed out with his graphs. Those are excellent resources, some of which you'll see in my slides as well. Um, increase access to transportation options, shared mobility options, um, for low and moderate income Vermonters, um, as well as helping them switch to cleaner transportation options, not necessarily vehicle. Um, we'll go in more uh, into what the options for Replace Your Ride include. Um, as you saw earlier, electricity has been stable as um, a price point um, uh, over the past um, 15 years or so, um, whereas petroleum, gas, and diesel is much more volatile. You know, we've seen this slide before, and I, I'm just, it's striking me that from sort of the sensitivity of the conversations we had this morning, that for many people, seeing prices spike on gasoline is an ongoing source of anxiety. Like, well, how much higher are they going to go? Um, you can over time, you might be spending twice as much a week filling your tank when we get to higher prices. So it's it's really true. And I think, you know, as we'll go into a little further, when we think about the purchase of a vehicle, whether it's a new or used vehicle, it kind of comes from like a different column in our family budget, no matter what budget we have, right? It's kind of a capital expense, right? It's a big investment. And the fueling of our vehicle, whether it's electricity, diesel, or gasoline, is more like the day-to-day. -day. So I could take some powdered milk and stretch out a gallon of milk a little bit further so that I could fill my tank of gas um, to compensate for some of those price fluctuations. And that has an impact on, on my family. So I think keeping in mind, you know, as we talk about Vermonters and their, their purchasing power, it's we can extend you know, that gallon of gasoline a little bit if we can extend the gallon of milk, um, but we have to get over that, that capital investment so that we can actually show them the, the cost savings with, with um, a fuel shift. Linda's the energy geek on the transportation geek. <laughs> um, and as you also saw from, from, uh, from, from Jared's slides, the emissions in Vermont, we're a small state and our emissions um, from transportation uh, keep, keep going up. So how do we, how do we put you know, Vermont carbon on, on a diet? How do we deal with this? And how do we deal with this across the board? Um, dealing with um, the, the transportation options that will help reduce um, emissions reductions. And as, uh, probably saw in Jared's slides, but we want to underscore here. Uh, the, the, the vehicles that replace your ride, at least right now we're starting to target or in our minds starting to target, are those 2012 and older. That's 54% of the total vehicles on the road in Vermont. Now, I get it. Vermonters, we want to hang on to our stuff. Why would we get rid of a perfectly good functioning vehicle? It is a culture shift to think, and I think it was... Uh, um, one of the senators earlier um, talking about, um, you know, how do you how do you get, uh, you know, we don't sell used manufacturers don't manufacture used vehicles, right? So how do we get the adoption of newer, cleaner vehicles um, when we hang on to our vehicles for a long time? A lot of this is these culture shifts and the outreach. That's a really integral part um, to our program, as well as you know what uh, Paul Zabriskie said earlier from um, from Capstone's perspective. So replace your ride. Here we go. Um, so we want this to be an offer of cash incentive. The whole idea is to scrap these older high polluting vehicles. Therefore, taking these vehicles permanently off the road and not saying, well, someone who can't afford another vehicle, you can drive this junker. We don't want that. We really want these scrapped. Um, and the options are to upgrade to transportation options, cleaner mobility, shared mobility, transit pass, electric, bu electric bike, electric motorcycle, um, Uber, Lyft, car share, any of those options, including the purchase of a new or used um, electric or plug-in electric vehicle, targeted towards low and moderate income Vermonter, Vermonters. And this incentive would be stacked on the state utility um, and other incentives. 
So we want to make it as easy and seamless as possible. The, 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 the double impact um, we have is really removing these old polluting vehicles and getting them off the road. So as I mentioned, this, um, this stackable, uh, these stackable incentives, we have the federal incentive, the state incentive that has um, different rates for low and moderate income Vermonters, utility incentives, mileage smart is also applicable, and then replace your ride on top of that. So we can have folks who see significant savings. Um, low and moderate income Vermonters generally are not going to have the tax liability for the federal tax incentive generally, um, but we still see these the ease of these savings um, for the purchase of um, newer used uh, electric or plug-in vehicles. So <clears throat> the new EV purchase or the used EV purchase, as we just mentioned with the graph with the, the gasoline, this puts money back, <clears throat> excuse me, back in the pockets of low of low income Vermonters. When you're not spending your kind of monthly income on fueling your vehicle um, and you have the incentives to support the purchase of a newer or new used, more efficient vehicle, that money is coming out of your monthly budget that's going right back into your pocket. You're not spending it on, um, on fuel or even maintenance. And, and to, to, to Jared's slides earlier, those were fuel costs. Those are not maintenance costs. That's not like the, um, the oil change or something breaking down on your 2012 or older vehicle. So the maintenance cost with um, electric vehicles is generally lower. It's not zero, but it's de definitely a lot lower. So if you look at these incentives, um, you can have, um, you know, I fully up to 17,000 for a new EV or up to 10,000 for a used EV purchase. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and this impacted uh, democratizing um, transportation is affordability, access, so when we look at older vehicles on the road, there's, you know, and I will admit, I have an old vehicle. It's older than 2012. Um, and it's, ugh, is, it gonna, is it gonna run this month? What's gonna, what's gonna happen? So that access to reliable transportation is really important. Um, and especially for folks in rural areas where transit and walking um, may not be as viable as it is you know, for me here in Burlington. The predictability, the, um, as you saw, um, the stability of, electric, of electricity versus um, petroleum prices. Um, and then having renewable electric power for, um, for electric vehicles, air quality, these are health issues. We don't think of air quality issues in Vermont. We have a lot of trees and so forth, and that's great. We don't think of you know, a smog-filled Los Angeles freeway, but our air quality issues are impacted by uh, the more high polluting vehicles we have on the road. And if we look at vulnerable populations in those high polluting vehicles, the impact is double on them. So this will also accelerate emission reductions by removing the older vehicles, as well as replacing it with the higher efficiency ones. So why mileage, why, mileage smart, why replace your ride? It's stackable, right? So ease of administration, it targets low income Vermonters only, clean is transportation options, the bonus is against the scrappage, and um, the um, administratively seamless piece with the other income eligibility programs that exist. Now, with this, I also want to underscore it that um, certainly from what Paul Zabriskie said earlier, we, we really need to invest in um, the outreach we need to invest with outreach to our partners as well as to um, rural Vermonters, recognizing that rural Vermonters are not a homogenous group. The messaging that we need for our program, any of our programs, what we say to folks in Richmond, 
we can't have the same conversation with, um, we can't use that same language necessarily with folks in Greensboro. We need to recognize um, the relationships we have with community action organizations for them to help inform how best we can move forward with this messaging and outreach. Um, Taylor, again, tailoring it specifically to those needs. Um, administratively, also talking about the financial process that we're using systems in place. I almost think of, for anyone who has sent a child off to college recently, the FAFSA. The FAFSA is like, I felt like I was ripping my soul out, but you do it once a year. And if we think of a system like that, where there's uh, the uh, mechanisms to enter this data for whatever other programs folks are involved in, and then the state um, for their incentive can use, can draw off that information. It's updated once a year or whenever there's significant changes in income, um, whether it's utilized for weatherization, free and reduced lunch or transportation. That's the piece that, that will help make it um, more seamless. And I think also, you know, when you go on a diet, we're going on a carbon diet. You stand on the scale first to know like, well, what do you need to lose? We have a sense of what we need to lose, but we need to invest also in the research to support the start and end of these incentive programs, because that's gonna clearly define what we're gonna measure, whether it's cost per ton avoided of greenhouse gas emissions, a reduction in BMT, and how do we evaluate those along income lines? These are taxpayer dollars, right? And you guys wanna know how, what's the bang for our buck? What, um, how are we moving the needle on reducing these emissions with, with this program and, and really any other incentive program? Um, so, uh, so, so again, looking at the, the return on investment um, with, an, with a program like Replace Your Ride, which we really feel um, can move the needle, not only on the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, but really providing uh, reliable transportation options for low and moderate income Vermonters. So what's happened so far? We have this fantastic core team um, and we are working very closely with the California Replace Your Ride program. They have been so, um, so fantastic in giving us resources on what's worked, what doesn't, and how we need to tailor them specifically to Vermont. So it isn't like we're just taking it and applying here to Vermont tweaking things along, uh, uh, along the way. Um, we did have our EAN um, summit pitch, so we're so pleased to um, have support from EAN. We have our uh, a steering committee and a wide advisory group. And with our advisory group, um, we kept asking ourselves, who else needs to be at the table? Uh, where, how do we need to move this conversation forward? We have conversations with the, um, auto dealers, the Vermont Auto Dealer Association, used car dealers. Um, now we're into scrappage and um, scrap yards. Um, that's our next group. We have our community action groups um, so that we can weave together the strongest, um, the strongest set of criteria as we move forward. Again, not just with the program and incentives, but with the outreach. Um, and as you know, Replace Your Ride was included in the draft of the House Transportation Modernization Act. <clears throat> um, we've also been in conversations with um, the federal delegation trying to see how we can position ourselves if there's any future, future federal funding opportunities um, coming down the road. So um, we're here to ask support, um, endorsement, investment um, in this opportunity. Uh, and again, we are working um, to identify additional funding streams. Uh, federal stimulus is, uh, is also a um, transportation climate initiative um, and establish our implementation capacity. Uh, as I mentioned, we have several options including um, electric bikes and motorcycles and transit and car share. So how do we roll that out? Accordingly, there are gonna be different messages for different groups. Um, and we work closely with Capstone and Mileage Start Smart. So again, weaving together all these lessons learned from our partners so that we can be as successful as possible rolling this out. Um, and this is a list of our uh, contacts and, and team members and advisory group. So Linda, you, um, I'll tag you now and see, you can pick all the pieces I missed. <laughs> 
Well, thank you. No, that was great. And before we go on to Ms. McGinnis, um, Senator Westman, do you do you have any questions you want to add while we're on this? Um, so I, I can wait till the end. I, I, I do okay. have uh, um, some questions when we get to the end. Um, but right now, is it the did the governor put 1.5 million in for um, um, replace my ride? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Ms. So, thank you. Um, there won't be any more presentation. We did this uh, presentation together, but I just wanted to uh, underscore a few really important points based on the previous conversation that was held this morning. The first is that we have been working with Capstone from the very beginning. Um, we co-presented this at the EAN um, conference and we are very uh, aware of the need for partnering with those who are the trusted partners at the local level. Um, this notion of democratizing the clean energy transition is really important in that, as you all know, uh, electric transportation is seen generally is something that only the wealthy can afford. Um, and it's time to be able to put that in the hands of low-income Vermonters because it actually helps them save considerably more from the household income than it would for higher income Vermonters. And Capstone has been a great partner in all of that. The second point that I really wanna emphasize is that we're trying to build off the existing successes that we have. Right now, we have a successful state incentive program that about half of the money in the state incentive program goes to low-income Vermonters. So it is working, right? Um, about half of that money goes to low-income Vermonters. What we'd like to do is ensure that the lowest-income Vermonters, we're only focusing on low-income Vermonters, have the, the best access to making that transition. We're also working on top of the beginning of Mileage Smart. It's successful so far, it's very early, but really add a boost to, to what Mileage Smart can do by adding another $3,000 on top of it for, again, the lowest income people. Um, the other piece that I think is really important that uh, Senator Bray mentioned earlier is this notion of re reducing anxiety. I do think that it's becoming increasingly clear, even with uh, the COVID period, that the anxiety surrounding uh, the prices of gas and diesel just to get to your needed services is something that is, is uh, foremost in the minds of um, low-income Vermonters. And this is something we're really trying to tackle there. Um, and finally, I know you know this, but it's really important that um, the bulk of incentives so far have been for um, new vehicles and um, for um, uh, tax-based incentives coming from the federal level. We are not proposing a tax-based incentive. We're propos proposing a cash incentive and allowing um, uh, the bulk of it to be used for used vehicles. Um, so that's an important piece as well. Um, and then, um, Finally, I think it's important to note that we learned from the dealers recently because um, Marilyn Miller from the Vermont Auto Dealers Association has been a, a core member of our steering committee. And in our last meeting, we heard from um, Bob Cody, a dealer in Montpelier um, and uh, Jane Lowry, who was a used car dealer. Bob Cody was saying that he is buying up every used um, uh, electric vehicle that he can right now because they are the fastest selling and he welcomes this program and says that other dealers that he's been working with around the state would love to have a program like this because it gets more people in the door. And then with respect to the role of Efficiency Vermont and VEIC, one of the things I know they've been discussing recently is the notion of, um, you know, they have their, um, their uh, certified weatherization network uh, for contractors. The idea of having a certified dealer network of dealers who are trained in how to explain how to do outreach, um, that uh, Efficiency Vermont and VEIC are core partners in our work as well. And I think that there's a, a real powerful role for each of these partners. Capstone is a, and other local agencies as the trusted partner, Efficiency Vermont, as a, a trainer and a data manager and, and possible administrator of the program, uh, being able to have the uh, incentives go out um, and, um, and then uh, keep all of the, the partnership at the local level with the CAP agencies. So those are just a few of the points I wanted to highlight. Um, 
one last thing is I wanted to underscore just how many cars are out there that are 20,012 and older. Um, we come at this from two standpoints. One is helping low-income Vermonters, but the other is meeting our greenhouse gas emission goals. And those 20,012 and earlier, it's been found um, across the nation, are the ones that are really high polluting. And if we can get those off the road and put safer, more reliable, uh, cheaper vehicles in the hands of low-income uh, Vermonters, that's what we're trying to do. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Westman. Um, how does um, this new program um, intend to connect with individuals? So the key area, so there's two ways that we would connect with individuals. Um, and this is working again with existing programs. Um, we're, we will not be the implementers. We're the ones putting the ideas forth um, and have gotten significant support from the public administration. So VTrans is, is supportive of this effort as has been uh, the partners we've been working with. So working with individuals would come primarily through organizations like Capstone uh, because this would help Capstone move away from doing a marginally better impact, I mean, uh, in mileage smart, of helping someone get into a new higher mile per gallon vehicle. This would help boost Capstone's effort to get people into electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids, okay? Because it would add that additional incentive. So Capstone and other agencies on the ground, we're meeting tomorrow with all of the CAP agencies or on Friday with all the CAP agencies would be key partners in reaching out to people. But I want to also underscore that um, Efficiency Vermont has learned a lot from their weatherization work and applying what they've learned from the weatherization work to get to individuals with good information to support the CAP agencies. CAP agencies don't have the bandwidth to come up with good marketing materials or to come up with all of the bullet points and everything. They're overloaded as it is. So with Efficiency Vermont, they can bring the wealth of their um, marketing, data analysis, outreach, all of that to help boost those who are the trusted partners on the ground. That's, that's the idea. But I, I would also say that the state incentive program, thanks to all of you that passed that, is reaching low and middle income Vermonters. Half of the, the people who are taking advantage of the state incentive program are low and middle income Vermonters right now. So they're stepping up already. So there's two different ways that we would like to work. One with that and the other with um, the more hand-holding approach of uh, Mileage Smart. So I really don't understand how this is going to mesh with Mileage Smart. So Mileage Smart, when they're talking to their, their um, clients, their customers, right, their partners, I don't know, I, I, the, the people that they work with on the ground, they would basically be able to say, um, we have this program where you can get a used vehicle. And if you turn in, your old higher polluting vehicle, you will get $3,000 more off of the cost of the vehicle that we're helping you to purchase. That's the simplest thing. If I'm talking to you and you say, oh, you know, I'd really like to get a new vehicle. Um, and um, the capstone people say, well, do you have a vehicle that you drive that you're having some problems with? Most likely, yes, or that it's expensive. They don't even have to have problems with it. They could say, you could get $3,000 for your vehicle and apply that to the purchase of a new plug-in electric vehicle, EV or plug-in electric vehicle. So right now, Mileage Smart can only offer 25% of the cost of a used vehicle. That's all they can offer, right? Right. Well, that's the only funding that they, they have so far. Right. So I'm just trying to figure out if I have mileage smart over here, um, you're going to be a supplement and feed on to the work that the counselors are doing at the community action agencies to offer um, a further incentive. Is that what I'm hearing? To scrap a vehicle. The key is the scrapping. 
So the key is that there is value in scrapping older high polluting vehicles so that you're replacing an existing high polluting, low reliability vehicle that a person currently has. And so if they don't wanna scrap their vehicle, they take, they, they take part in the mileage smart as is. But what we'd like to do is boost the greenhouse gas emissions reduction and get those older non-functioning vehicles off the road. <laughs> I, I'm not questioning that, and I, um, I, I think these are all great goals. I'm trying to understand the physical structure of how I'm putting this together to make sure that I'm reaching people at their level and have something administratively that is as streamlined as it can be and as efficient as it can be. So um, I, I'm trying to understand the two programs. And, and, and what the goals and how they fit together are. One of the ways that I thought um, was useful that Dan Dutcher at VTrans um, suggested um, is that uh, it would be an additional line item on the state incentive program. Basically, if you are applying to the state incentive program and you have an old vehicle that you wanna scrap to get the additional incentive, you just check off that one and you get the additional amount. If you're going through the mileage smart program, there's an additional line. If you have an old vehicle that you want to scrap, that's the additional piece that you do. So it's just an add on to both programs. Okay. Um, I, I have a question about, I remember, I, I don't remember how many years ago already it is, but there was a national cash for clunkers program. For all I know, it might still be alive somewhere in federal statute. Uh, and so uh, can, did you, I, I'm sure you looked at that. Can you say something about um, how effective that was and how that's influenced how you've designed this? So yeah. let me just jump in quickly, Linda. Yesterday on NPR, they just teed it right up for us. There was a piece on NPR about the cash for clunkers and how what happened is they're, they're, the income eligibility just meant that a lot more people who would have eventually purchased a new car anyway took advantage of it. It wasn't really targeted towards low and moderate income Vermonters. So look up, I'll, maybe I can forward, forward you the link. Um, but the Biden administration wants to look into that again um, and looking at you know how do we research to make it more effective? So go, go ahead, Linda. <laughs> Yeah, we'll put the link in the chat because it was really terrific. So thank you for asking the question, Senator Bray. Um, the Cash for Clunkers program uh, took place uh, a number of years ago, about 15 years ago, um, and was intended to be an e economic boost um, to the auto industry. Um, and it, was, it offered incentives to replace a lower mileage vehicle with a higher mileage vehicle. Um, there were some pluses and minuses from the program and the current current replace your ride is, is learning lessons from all of the things that didn't work in cash for clunkers. Um, and we're modeling it off the California program, which used that information to build a better program. So some of the lessons learned from that was that if you're just replacing a low mileage vehicle with a high mileage vehicle, you're not going to get that much um, impact on your greenhouse gas emissions. Second was that they didn't do any targeting at all. So it actually was a lot of wealthy people that ended up uh, benefiting from that uh, program. Um, and so what we're trying to do is target low-income people only because that's who you wanna benefit. And second, not to target higher mile per gallon vehicles, but to target instead only electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. Um, and then the third part was on the economic impact. Did it help? Um, more vehicles uh, get on the road, um, more higher mileage vehicles get on the road. It did, um, uh, but the impact could be greater if you're focusing on both low income and on um, vehicles that um, help low income people reduce um, their overall expenditures. And then you would also have much higher greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And that's what this program is modeled on the successful California program. Um, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't have, I didn't get to read the full list of partners slide. There were a lot of partners there. Um, I'm guessing the distribution utilities, especially with their tier three programs must be part of your 
team, right? Yeah. It seems like yes. A We're, in fact, we have a meeting there. with them with them on Friday. Yes, indeed. We keep like, again. We keep asking who's at the table. What specific conversations do we need to have with our um, utilities? So yes, indeed. Okay, um, because their contribution could be part of your stack as well, right? Yeah. Oh, that's a um, I, yeah. If you go back, if you go back to the slide on the stack. Um, uh, the stacking includes the utility because uh, utilities are currently the ones that are implementing the state incentive um, and they also have their own incentives. Um, so that's all part of the, the stacking that's important. Um, okay. Um, and how about one of the other things we've heard about the challenges, especially for uh, lower income Vermonters, a significant portion of who may be renting is the charging at home piece of things. Are you able to bring resources to that piece of the puzzle? Right, and that's a, that's a great question. So um, that's why working with the utilities is important. Um, also looking at um, what other policies exist for charging for multi-unit dwellings. Um, Burlington Electric um, had an advisory group that was run by the Cadmus Group out of Cambridge, looking at um, what are options without having to um, totally rip up infrastructure. So there are different programs like EV Match, which has um, uh, kind of like a, like a crowdsourcing. So I have a charger at my house, I have an EV match sign, and that means that um, anyone in my neighborhood um, can get on their app and see that I've got charging here. It also means we need to roll out even more charging, but the state of Vermont has um, the highest number of uh, charging um, units per capita. Claim to fame here. <laughs> Once you add that per capita, we are, we are winners in more categories. Where I know. <laughs> right. But um, yes, it's, def it's definitely on the, on, the, on the forefront. We don't want someone unplugging the refrigerator to charge their vehicle, um, but also looking at workplace, char workplace charging and yeah. um, sort of banks of shared um, charging units. Great. Uh, Senator McDonald? Um, Mr. Chairman, the... Uh... The cash for clunkers was paid for by the federal government with deficit spending. Um, it was an economic um, stimulus package following the, as the witnesses have suggested, following the Great Recession, and it was designed to put people to work um, building new cars. And um, look, we're, you're speaking to, uh, to us, and, and we, we don't have the authority to print money, and you've... Um, I think mean, you use the metaphor that we're using this to jumpstart something. Um, if you want to jumpstart a car, you need a battery. Um, how how is the how are these cash for clunker et cetera programs and jumpstarting sales? How how should they be paid for? We um, tax spend and regulate. That's all we do. How do so we pay for this? That's a good question. I'm going to leave Linda to how the pay for us. This this isn't um, this isn't a cash for clunkers. This is um, scrapping old vehicles to reduce greenhouse uh, green, greenhouse gas emissions yes. and stacking yes. that incentive onto the existing incentives. So, um, as Linda or pointed out, um, there is already money at least mentioned by Governor Scott. Um, um, allocated for this program. Lynn, do you want to tag on to that? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. Thank you, Senator McDonald, and I understand um, where you're going. Uh, what is currently being proposed by the House, uh, about a million dollars, and by the governor, $1.5 million, is intended only to, to get the administration in place. You are absolutely right that fun, much more funding will be necessary to attack the problem at the scale that we need to attack it, both in terms of transportation poverty and in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. We know, um, I work with people in DC as well, that there is a, a high potential for uh, funding to be coming through the federal government in terms of federal stimulus for this type of program. If, and, and we've been working with the federal delegation in hopes of trying to make sure that something like that can come. So for longer term, larger amounts of funding, 
there is, there is considerable support for this kind of very targeted high impact incentive. And this, the, the type of incentive that we have at the federal level right now, the $7,500 is for everybody, right? It's not targeted. The second piece of funding that I think is really important to consider, and I would beg all of you to continue to, to do the work that you've been doing it uh, to, to support it, is from something like the Transportation Climate Initiative. The Transportation Climate First. Initiative, much like REGI, which is the most successful cap and invest program in the nation, in the world actually regional, um, it, TCI is applying the same thing that we learned from REGI to transportation. And with that, this state would receive predictable, regular funding coming in to be able to support something like this. So I see that there are several options. One is that with our very limited resources in Vermont, we need to set up a system such that when other resources become available, be they through the federal stimulus package or infrastructure package or through um, TCI, we have a system that would be able to ramp up um, and have learned some of the you know, difficulties of implementation in the beginning and be able to move quickly on that front. So those are the three sources of funding that I would consider. So they're all someone else's money. And we're not in charge of other people's money. So what are well, you asking it, us to do in the meantime? In the meantime, I, <laughs> we would love for um, Vermont money to be put in just like the state incentive program at a minimum one to $2 million this year to get this program up and running so that we can see if we are actually having the impact on low income Vermonters, helping them to make the transition that many of them are asking to make but can't afford to make that would enable them to have a much more affordable life year in and year out going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm trying to ask yes, questions sir. to find out you know, what the plan is and I, I'm, I will use the term mouse meat about a million bucks um, to, to deal with this because we're dealing with uh, problems that are in the hundreds of millions of dollars worth of challenge. So um, so I've said my mouse meat on the proposal for this year, but I wanna know what the, the plan is as we sit and watch ever growing number of gas guzzling vehicles going out onto the highway brand new that, um, we're thinking about subsidizing the crushing of them when they become older vehicles because they're gas guzzlers. Um, we're, we're watching the horse go out of the barn and we're leaning against the door that we're not trying to close. Thank you. Um, well, I've two thoughts. One is I, my understanding was that you were having at least informal conversations with Senator Perchlick around a fee bait bill and I don't well, yeah, we're not supposed to use the word prebate, but we're uh, the bill formerly known as prebate. We're we're yeah, we're working on that. What's its What's its new marketing savvy name? Uh, the bill Does formerly known yet? as the prebate bill. That will be its name. <laughs> okay, the Voldemort uh, bill. <laughs> we'll um, put so. the word partner between every other word in our presentation. So. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I don't, this isn't your job, uh, Ms. O'Neill or Ms. McGinnis, um, but do no. you, to, to Senator McDonald's <laughs> point uh, on mouse, mouse meat or bigger, um, whatever size it is, have you estimated the total spend over, you know, a decade, that kind of thing, just looking at the, the size of the task ahead of us? I know we got data from uh, REP last year. They they came in and gave us some numbers. I think it was in the uh, six hundred million dollar range. That kind of a thing. Um, we haven't done a current estimate, but I'm happy to do a ballpark. Things are changing so rapidly. The price of EVs are going down dramatically. Um, the price of used EVs are going down dramatically. So um, and. We're hearing from auto dealers across the country that, you know, was it GM most recently that said they will do, they right. will produce not a single new gas powered vehicle by the year 2025 or 2030. I'll have to look that up. But every 30, 
2035. Okay, 2035. So, but every major manufacturer um, is shifting their strategy right now. Um, so I think that's going to shift. But to your point, um, in terms of what the overall expenditure for uh, Vermont would be to make this shift, um, we're happy to put together new figures and get those to you. It would be less than what was uh, estimated by RAP last year, um, in large part because of the cost of new EVs dropping so dramatically. Yeah. Yeah, actually, um, we may be seeing some of the economies that we saw on solar panels. I don't know that it will be a tenfold drop, but uh, Senator McDonald. Just, I'm, I, I'm not trying to diminish the witnesses' hard work here. and. We're, we are all politicians who have decisions over taxing, spending, and, and regulating all of which people in citizen reader tend to not like. And if you don't put a mile marker out ahead of us and a goal out ahead of us that is more than we are comfortable with, um, instead of, you know, sort of hounding us from behind um we're, we're 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 not bold people and if you have bold ideas include the money and then let us you know inevitably disappoint you but at least put a target out there that is beyond our reach um, thank you some of this testimony Hello. we've been receiving is <laughs> underwhelming um you know we can say tell tell you all that you're wonderful and you're right how much do we yeah, have to spend that, and where are we getting it? Thank that's, you. That's, that's, that's great feedback. We can tell you what, um, what, what to spend and where to put it. I, I mean, it, like invest it. <laughs> Thank you for that feedback. <laughs> yeah, message received and well appreciated. We had started out with the much larger, um, the much larger uh, amounts and decided that we wanted to stay real, realistic right now, but I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, our job is to show what um, the reach is and your job is to say what's realistic. So thank you very much for that feedback. Um, and I will get right back to you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, one thing considering for the, the value stack is we discussed several years ago, waiving purchasing use tax, which is another uh, up to the first $30,000 on a vehicle for a of um, an EV and half of that for a, a hybrid electric vehicle. So that's another tool in the kit for, um, it's, not, it's not money on the barrel, but it's a, a debt immediately removed from at time of sale. So it's better than waiting for the feds to send you money or something like that. Um, um, so that's one thing you might look at. And there was one slide I think I would offer some feedback on. It said that, you know, if you get into an EV, you'll have no emissions. And I think that's something we want to be careful about because even though Vermont's the cleanest grid in the country, we're still at 63% renewable energy. So there's 37% out there that may well be fossil fuel. It's no tailpipe emissions. You're right. We should actually clarify that. Right. It's no tailpipe emissions because you actually get emissions right. from having your wheels on the road. Um, that's a really good point. We will adjust well, and that. I'm thinking Thank you. of the emissions re at the generating station that's applied the grid power. Um, I think they, well, anyway, we're on the right track with that, but I'm just being careful about it so that someone doesn't say, well, how about that coal plant in the state next door that generated the power that came over your wire, that powered your car, that kind of thing. Um, all right, so um, I'm looking around to see if there are any other questions. As you can see, we're a pretty shy committee about uh, ideas and questions. So um, <laughs> anything? <laughs> if, if I could, yeah. Senator Bray, just uh, one other thing to yeah, please. something that you all brought up um, because I know you've been working hard uh, on these things. Um, the notion of the fee bait that shall not be named fee bait, um, uh, that's a really important tool. Um, as an economist, I'll just say that that's something that is really worth your deep consideration, um, especially if you can accompany it 
with a program like Replace Your Ride that really helps those who might be most impacted. So that's the whole point of a, of a fee bait is that you then generate regular predictable uh, revenues that can be utilized to help those who need it most. So I'm just throwing, this is my personal opinion, um, but I'm just throwing that in. Um, and I thank you for your hard work on that because it's a difficult type of thing to decide on, but it's extremely important. Every time someone makes a decision to purchase something that's going to pollute the next 30 years, we have to make it much more difficult um, so that when you come to that purchase price decision, what you want to choose is the clean, affordable option. And that's what the fee bait that shall not be named is all about. Right. right. The, um... I think you've named our bill. <laughs> yes, that'll, no one will forget it and everyone might chuckle. So um, the, uh, that would be a start. All right, uh, any other committee questions for uh, Ms. O'Neill or Ms. McGinnis? All right, well, thank you for hanging in there. It's been a relatively long, long Zoom morning and um, thanks for your input. And we're gonna be hearing more about Mileage Smart. So we'll have a chance to uh, continue to learn about some of your partners out there. Uh, sorry. Turn McDonald, cover your ears. I just said the word partners. <laughs> um, Senators, thank you very much okay. for having us. Yeah. Okay. And I hope it wasn't too terrible an experience visiting uh, with the committee this, so far. Oh, this is great. This is great. I can't wait to come back. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks. Good to thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Um, so, committee, uh, other than one minute of committee time, I think we're going to, we'll wrap for the morning. Um, and that is just to remind people what I was saying before, as we pick back up again, you know, I'm hoping people, I'm, I know people are taking notes. Um, and I hope that you'll, um, in the next week, look back through your notes and so that you'll have things in mind. Some of the most, uh, the strongest ideas we heard around how weatherization might be a stronger program and how we might manage weatherization plus other programs like transportation effectively, how we might reach better the people we need to reach, um, how we'll know that we're getting the performance that we need out of programs um, and how they come together uh, and funding, uh, you know, how do we fund at scale um, and yeah, I think that those are enough to do's, but that's, I think, what's going to be woven into our, our bill uh, in the next three weeks. So, um, and with that, um, we have uh, finished. Any, uh, any new business, anything anyone else wants to bring up? Um, and just as a uh, looking ahead to tomorrow. So tomorrow we're going to hear a little bit about uh, building energy labeling and the impact that has. Uh, and the reason we're revisiting that is, you know, we've heard repeatedly one of the things that's hard to do if the marketplace, if the, if the real estate marketplace will, cannot quote unquote see, and sometimes that means the banks can't quote unquote see the value of weatherization, um, then it makes it even harder for someone who wants to go ahead to say, this is a worthwhile investment because when I move in seven years, my house is gonna do better in the marketplace. I'll make at least some of that money back. And um, I don't know that that's currently true with the way we list homes and um, the value, literally monetize the value of weatherization in a home. So. Uh, tomorrow we'll be hearing about uh, labeling. We'll hear from realtors and we'll hear from uh, lenders to see if we can um, crack that piece, of, crack that nut, which has been an obstruction for at least a decade. Uh, Senator McCormick. Yeah, thanks. Just before we adjourn, I want to uh, express agreement with uh, Senator McDonald's observation that we, when we talk about 
old gas guzzlers that today's new cars are tomorrow's um, old gas guzzlers. And uh, I, I, I didn't want to, I didn't want the witnesses to feel we were pig piling on them. And Mark was articulating the idea perfectly fine without my help. But I did want to make, just mention that, but I, I think Mark is absolutely right. And we have to think in terms of what, how these new cars are going to end up in the future. Other, otherwise, you know, we, we are providing the gas guzzlers or our society, not us, but the, the society is. And I think we have to address that. Yeah, and they are around for a surprisingly long period of time. Mm -hmm. So says he with a not very new car. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So um, thank you everyone for uh, productive, another productive morning. I feel like we're in grad school this year. It's like every day, more information. Um, so we'll be writing our thesis together in the next three weeks. And uh, I don't know who's we're presenting to. Rest of